Stone Cold Steve Austin, great yes. to have you on the show. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I'm going to kick Neil's butt here in a minute in front of the camera and everything else. <laughs> did you watch WWF growing up? Uh, I did. I did a little bit. My dad, I mean, I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, so there's a lot of wrestling town. Jerry the King Lawler, all those guys. So, yeah, I, I jumped off a lot of furniture, landed <laughs> on my sister, and <laughs> suplexed the dog every once in a while, things like that. <laughs> did you? But notice I called it WWF, right? Yeah, it's WWE when now. You and I were kids, and being Australian, we, we even watched American sports and wrestling. Yeah, I think it was what? There was an animal, Worldwide Animal Association or something that was ah, WWF, that was, and that's yeah. why they changed it. But just the other day, I was with a mate, and we were watching the uh, Rumble. What's it called? When they the Royal Rumble. Royal Rumble, where they all get into the cage. Yeah. Well, not, not the cage, but the, every five minutes or ten minutes, they release a new wrestler. Oh, yeah. And you've got to throw them over the top ropes. Yeah, to get them out. But yeah. I, I, yeah, I watched you know an old one from back in the 90s. I mean, compared to what's on the sh TV today, it felt yeah. really wholesome. I was like, I want my son to watch this. Hulk That's Hogan, right. Ultimate Warrior, Brett the Hitman That's Hart. Right. Look at the way the guy took the chair to the face. It's just magical, <laughs> right? It's just beautiful. Wholesome. It was a That's wholesome right. way he took that. Yeah. I remember my cousin and I would wrestle on the bed, and we would like cut, we would agree beforehand who would win, right? Yeah. Like, I, it's, I'm going to come on really strong. Yeah. I'm going to allow you to win at the end, and that's what that's right. Doing. You're going to be the heel. I'm going to be the hero, right? <laughs> yeah. You're working it all out. Next thing you know, somebody's in a figure four and screaming. <laughs> <laughs> I remember where I was when I found out that it was fake. Oh yeah, it, it was almost as traumatic as Father Christmas. Yeah, I, yeah. I was with my cousin, same cousin I used to wrestle with, and that someone said it's fake, and my cousin knew that it was, and I didn't, and it, I just it was crushing. That's right. He didn't think it was fake when the guy hit him with a two-by-four for telling him it was fake, right? What do people what, <laughs> what do people like that? I don't know. I don't know. I just – those guys, whether it's fake or not, they're getting hit with stuff and falling off stuff, so you got to give them that. But it was entertaining. I wanted to be Hulk Hogan when I was little. Yeah. You know, I wanted to be Macho Man. Oh, yeah, brother, all that stuff. Yeah. and. And The Rock, all those guys. You know, now I couldn't tell you who's on there. Yeah. You know, because I grew, I grew up matured and stuff. You know, but. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm like, maybe tonight I could watch it with my son. That's right. That That's bit right. where Hulk Hogan would do the finger. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they do all that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, know, yes. All my Hulkamaniacs out there. It's so American. <laughs> like, it it's, is. It, I don't know if you know what I mean by that, because it's almost <laughs> yeah. like telling a... A fish about the water it's yeah. like i don't understand what do you what do you mean but like in australia if you try to get something like that off the ground mm -hmm. we're just a lot more subtle americans are much more colorful much yeah. more loud um donald trump yeah <laughs> like, that's a good one to pick yeah, he was on the right. wwf yeah that's he right. was he was on there a lot and like i said i'm from memphis and that's where a lot of that started like hulk hogan and a lot of those guys would come through town when they weren't hulk hogan they were like Terry the Terrible or something like that, you know, or The Rock had some, you know, crazy, you know, curl thing going on and pink <laughs> pants, and they turn into these bigger characters later. But yeah, yeah. You know, that's where uh, Andy Kaufman came and did all that stuff with Jay Lawler, where he went on the Late Show and and they, you know, he slapped Andy Kaufman on TV and it made wrestling popular at the time. I have to look that up. Yeah, I, I, yeah I, it's funny. It was it wound up being a bit, but Andy Kaufman, he's a funny guy. Yeah, and he wouldn't wrestle the men; he only wanted to wrestle the women. <laughs> and so it's it, sad because it, today you have yeah. yeah men who say they're women who are only interested in wrestling women. Why did you have to go? There, I know. Why I, I just brought it down. <laughs> did you bring me another beer? <laughs> Oh, man. It's great to have you on the show. Yeah. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks, man. You know, I love you, and I love being here with you, so thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. So for those who don't know, you run a podcast called Just Go in the Pew. That's right. Cool. Found everywhere. YouTube's everywhere. Yeah, on everything. We'll, we'll make sure we put a link in the description. There oh, look yeah. at that. Look How at good that. is Neil? It's there already. Give him a dollar. <laughs> All right. That's <laughs> very demeaning. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that pays me in beers. Yeah. Oh, there you That's go. That's right. Yeah. Uh, he's already living that. high on the hog. Yeah. But uh, and you gave a talk last night at Franciscan. Yeah, first time you've been there. Yeah, it's the first time I've heard so much about it, and obviously seen all the people that I've looked up for, you know, to for so long. You and Stefanik and Dr. Hahn and all these different people, and so it was it was awesome to get to go there. You know, it was a real privilege to speak to the students. Um, and we got. To, I want to say something nice about Dr. Hahn, just because it's nice to say nice things about people behind their back. <laughs> uh, you and I went to Holy Mass at four. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Hahn goes to Holy Mass every day. Yeah. You know, he's either at the noon or the four. Or I, I'm always seeing him there. Um, and and him and Kimberly always sit together, and it's just beautiful to see their affection yeah. towards one another. So I think as we were walking out, 
you know, he, he's got his arm wrapped around yeah, her. They, their heads are together. They're clearly praying together. Yeah. And it's such a beautiful witness to college kids who may have had a broken family or something like that, that they can see this guy's the real deal. Yeah, it was because, I mean, sometimes you see families at mass and they're sitting like three feet apart, but they were right there together. And yeah. you just tell us something special in their life. And it is a great example. You know, I was thinking that, you know, I went to University of Memphis and there was no Catholic stuff really around. And I was sitting there during mass with you and just walking around the campus and stuff going, man, like, how different might my life have been yeah. if, I, if I was at a place like this? I think know? it was before Father Scanlon took over Franciscan University of Steubenville, this university was in the top 10 party houses in Playboy magazine. Oh, wow. I believe I've got that correct. Top 10, I believe, listed, wow. yeah. So it was an absolute crap hole. Yeah. And I, I think, if memory serves, Father Scanlon was sort of brought in maybe to kind of Began to close it down. Yeah, but he totally revivified it. He had this sort of awakening in the charismatic renewal. Yeah, um, and he turned like the frat houses became like men's and women's households where they would pray together and sure. Yeah, Jesus became just I, the center. And look at it now, you know. Yeah, I never knew that. That's crazy that, yeah. that on a Catholic university that there's. <laughs> well, it's not that crazy. I mean, most Catholic universities are garbage. Yeah, but. Yeah, man. But you grew up Baptist. Yes, I did. Both your parents Baptist? Yes. Yeah, all their life. They were born and raised in a small town in Mississippi. I mean, when I say small town, like 600 people. And, you know, you had a couple of different Baptist church strewn around, you know, on the way to town or whatever. Um, they dated since the seventh grade, moved to Memphis. And, um, you know, we found a church, Union Avenue Baptist, right there in the middle of town. And that's where I grew up and really had all my friends. You know, I went to an Episcopal school, but... Um, I never was a, a guy that was real popular there. It was a school with means. A lot of people had a lot of money, and we didn't have, you know, we weren't rolling up in a Mercedes. We were rolling up in a 1978 Ford Explorer pickup truck, you know, and, and so it was a little difficult there. But, um, you know, I, I found this church and had friends. When you go look in a photo album and you see me and my sisters and the, the kids we grew up with at 4, at 8, at 10, at 12, and all the way up to 18, and, uh, you know, that, that's really where I fell in love with the Lord. You know, I mm -hmm. loved you doing all the things that you do in the Baptist church, going to mission trips and evangelization, uh, you know, walks through the neighborhood, inviting people to church, vacation, Bible school, all of that stuff. And it's really where I developed a relationship for the Lord and just a love for him. Right. I wanted to, to bring him to other people. And were your, were your parents equally as involved as you were? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, they. it was a little different. They were older than most parents. So I think my parents had me when they were like 37. Mm. So I probably wasn't on purpose. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but seriously. <laughs> yeah, <Wah>! but seriously. <laughs> but I'm still dealing with it. No. <laughs> but no, they, you know, they had me when they were 37. And so a lot of the kids my age, their parents were younger. Yeah. So they felt awkward, you know, going to these groups where people were 10 or 15 years younger than them. So they would more drop us off to Sunday school, and then they would come back and we would go to the service together, you know, and sit sit through the service. And so that's how I grew up with it. But my mom and dad, I mean, they both were very spiritual people. You know, my mom was always talking about Christ. My grandparents, they were the type that were like, no working on Sunday. You can fish or whatever, but no cutting the yard, no doing anything. You're going to sit in here and just appreciate mm -hmm. what the Lord's done for you, you know. So that's really how I grew up. And it was that way until I was 18. You know, we just uh, – friends for life, you know, at that point. At least I thought – and then, you know, we I live in Memphis, which is surrounded by all these SEC schools, and people's parents went to school at all those places, Mississippi State, Ole Miss, Arkansas. And so all of a sudden, you know, where I hadn't really thought much about what my life was going to entail after all of this, all these guys sort of moved off, you know, and said, I'm going to go to Auburn because my parents did, or I want to go to Tennessee or wherever. And one day I woke up and all that was gone, you know, and I, I didn't realize how much it meant to me, man. I was really mm. lonely. And Did you ever get baptized? Yes. How old were you? Um, I was about <clears throat> 10, I think. So, you know, it's crazy in, the, in, in that world. You see all your buddies doing it, and you never know, like, am I going to do this because – um, you know, <laughs> sorry, I'm I don't try to laugh at the, the coke all coke over myself. <laughs> Is difficult. it sticky or yeah, uh, it's kind of gross? <laughs> I have to wash that. But you see, you see all the people you know that are going up there, and as a kid, you know, you always want to do what your buddies are doing. Yeah. So you never know, like, is this really Jesus moving me to to give my life to him, or am I just like, you know, Tommy's up there and he likes He Man and I like He Man and I want to go up there too, you know, that kind of thing. Now, did you uh, 
because Baptists have that tradition of you know accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Yeah. Is that something you did prior to being baptized? Yeah. Oh well, that's actually what happened was we had a church camp every every year that we went to for a week. It was down in Mississippi, and it was some of the best memories of my life. Yeah. And again, I saw many of my friends. The pastor would always come down, you know, one night to give a, a sermon to everybody, and there were always kids that would wind up crying and walking up there and. And uh, just the feeling of being with these kids and just experiencing God for a solid week together all day long. Mm. Um, there were many times where I felt that, but I didn't because I was like, I don't know if this is real or not. Like, I don't know. I love that. I love that even is. at that age, you wanted things to be real. Right. Not and, a show. Right. So I wound up one day, the pastor just said something to me, and I just felt myself get up out of a chair and walk up front. And with a tear in my eye, I said, I, I want to give Jesus my life. You know, I love him. I, at the time, I probably didn't even know what that really meant. But I was like, I just I have this feeling that I'm supposed to do this. And so a week later, we went back to the church, and that's when you get in your nice clothes, and then they call you up front and announce to the church that you're going to, to be baptized. And That's beautiful. Yeah. Shortly after that, I think another week, I'm sitting there in a robe, you know, walking down into this huge tub of water and mm. hoping my robe doesn't come up so the girl behind me doesn't <laughs> see my Superman undies or whatever. And, yeah. and, uh, and then, you know, get dunked and come up, and, and uh, that was it, man. Wow. But in that moment, it's one of my favorite moments. And I have some Sunday school teachers and things that follow me on Facebook, and they'll reach out and see some of the things we're doing today, and yeah. say, I, you know, this is the person I, you know, that I kind of thought you might grow up to be, which is a great compliment. Um, one in particular tells me about how there was a lot of kids at Vacation Bible School again that wanted to do the things their friends were doing, and mm. how I walked over and had conversations with a lot of them about, like, are you, are you sure you want to do this for you? Is this are you doing it because of them? And so I don't know for whatever reason, but I, I always felt that that needed to be serious and not what somebody else is doing because you don't want to just jump into something because everybody else is doing it. It needs to be a change in your heart. So, yeah, at that point in my life, um, it just I felt like Jesus was my best friend, right? And that's all I wanted to do was just so many concerts and, and things like that, some of it designed to elicit some of these feelings out mm-hmm. of you. But uh, they're some of my favorite memories, you know, of just of – being there with people that, you know, it's those times of your life where you're like, I hope this never ends, hmm. you know. And then when you went to college, you said these friends, most of them moved away? Yeah, they left me like a bad habit. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, they all left to go um, to pursue, you know, what they wanted to do and follow yeah. in their parents' footsteps. And I was never a guy that knew what I wanted to do with my life, right? I wanted to play basketball. Me neither. And, but I knew I wasn't, you know, wasn't going to be a guy in the NBA or anything. Love the University of Memphis. My dad used to take me to their basketball games all the time. And, um, and so I, I just said, I'll go to school there. It was local. It was commuter school. So I start going, and I'm on campus, and, you know, I'm thinking, this is awesome. You know, there's all these people I've never met. But it, it, no one spoke to you a lot, right? If you didn't know people, then they just didn't talk to you. So, mm-hmm. and I'm, an, I'm an, you know, an extrovert, obviously. I like to talk. So I wanted to, to meet people, and I would try and try and try. And it was the loneliest I felt, like, ever in my life at that point was, what do you got to do to make friends, mm-hmm. you know? And, and I quit going to church a lot because no one was there anymore. At that church, the next oldest group would have been the group my parents didn't want to go to. Mm-hmm. So I was out of a youth group to, like, 35-year-olds. And so there was no place for me. And so I, I'd still go to the service on Sunday, but, um, you know, I started looking around. And one day, you know, I was obviously noticing there's all these pretty girls on campus. And I'd like to, you know, talk to one of them, maybe have friends with one of them, maybe kiss one every once in a while, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. And so uh, I would go up and try to talk to them. And they just wouldn't, you know, they're like, yeah, okay, and doing their thing. And, uh, you know, obviously they didn't realize how handsome I was. I guess they did it, yeah. <laughs> but, um, I, I, you know, one day I walked up to this girl in particular, and she was really good looking, and I just, you know, wanted to, to talk to her. And she kind of said, no, um, you know, I, I've got a boyfriend, whatever. Well, this guy walks in the room later, and he's got on this fraternity shirt. And all these girls start talking to him. He's walking around the room like he owns the place. I don't even think he was in our class. You know, he just walked <laughs> Who is in this there. Guy? I'm going to talk to these babes for a minute. You sit over there, loser. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I thought, well, I should probably get one of those. I mean, it seems like that's the secret, right? Get one of those shirts. So I knew one guy I left in, in Memphis uh, that had gone to my church, and we'd gone to high school together. He was a couple years <laughs> older. And I knew that he was doing something with the fraternity. I didn't know a lot about fraternities. My dad wasn't in one, anything like that. 
So I called him. He said, you know what? It's it's fall, and we're about to start rush, and you should come out. We're going to be at this bar, you know, come out and hang around with the guys, see if they like you. So you get a bid and all that, and you go through this process where you're basically yeah, Explain that to me, the yeah. bid, because I mean, not ever. I never went to college until sure. after I got married mm -hmm. uh, in America. So And there was definitely it's, no frat houses for me when I was like sure. married with kids. <laughs> sure. It's weird. What's it, a bid? You're literally, it's what they say, like, we want you. Oh, I see. It's really kind of a weird deal because you show up and you... Like, you know there's people watching you and, like, wanting to know if you're cool or not, which is completely degrading now that I think about it. It's like, I'm trying to prove to you that I'm worthy of you kind of mm, thing. Yeah. And uh, so you kind of go and you try not to act like an idiot or be a fool or, you know, admit how probably insecure you are in yourself and things like that. And eventually you kind of wait around and then you get a bid. You know, they have this week where you go around to all the fraternities and they start saying, well, you know, we want to look at this guy and they invite you back. And it's kind of like going on a date two or three times and deciding if you like each other or not. So I got one of those and uh, to Sigma Chi, the fraternity I was in, and it all started. You know, you started pledging and you're going to school, trying to keep your grades up, all those things. And... You know, they had all kind of stuff. Like you had a black book, you had to get so many signatures, you had links that they had, and if you screwed up, they'd take a link. If you ran out of links, you were out. See, all now, this kind of links stuff. today mean a link to a website. Yeah. What, what do you mean? <laughs> These are like chain links. Like you would chain a dog to a fence. They okay. would give you like so many of them. And if you made somebody mad or like you were an idiot or embarrassed them or Holy smokes. Yeah, they would they would cut one of them. This and really you does out. sound like a cult. It is. <laughs> it really is. A cult made of women, beer and drugs. <laughs> <laughs> but, but so like I mean, most religious cults. Right. I think, <laughs> really. <laughs> That's right. Don't drink the purple Kool-Aid. But no, there was there was a time where I was just excited to be involved in that. But what happened next was, man, you know, man, and I say this to a lot of to younger folks when I give talks at high school and college and stuff, is I walked away from the church the day that I, I went in that fraternity. It was like this whole world opened up of my, you know, kind of closed, baptized eyes, no drinking, no dancing, no any of that stuff. And now all of a sudden there's a lot of drinking, a lot of dancing, and just this whole other world. And quickly you can get pulled into it. And so all of a sudden I wanted, I was looking for people to have a community with again in my life to, to really like me and to be the, have the friendships we had at the time I had been working at this job since I was 16, selling auto parts and, you know, at Napa auto parts. And I'd worked my way up a couple of years. I was making decent money. By the time I got in, I was making almost 30 grand. It was a college kid that had virtually no bills. Mm -hmm. And so people found out, you know, I, I had money. And, and so I had a car that was paid for. I had money to put in a gas tank. I could buy, you know, booze and get people into clubs. And so all of a sudden I had a lot of friends, right? And I thought it was because of me. But honestly, it was because of what I could do for people. And that's what I would say to, you know, people that might be listening they're younger at this point was – I didn't know who I was. The day I walked away from that church, I walked away from my identity as a beloved son of God. And I started trying to be something else to anybody else because I wanted to be included. So, you know, there were a lot of nights where I did things I wasn't proud of and, and just really did whatever it took to, to get involved with, you know, people liking me. So, I mean, I was drinking tons of beer, getting hammered, driving every night, not worrying about getting a DUI, paying for people to get into places, all of that. And I started hanging out with everybody. I started getting real popular. And then there was, you know, one night I was hanging out with some guys and, um, you know, they were smoking pot and I started smoking pot. Then they started taking pills, you know, later and I started taking pills. And I, I don't want to make it like that was all their fault. I made choices, right? It was yeah. just around. Uh, next thing you know, LSD, stuff like that. It was around and I took that and ecstasy and all of that. And next thing you know, I, I walked away from everything that I was. So this one night in particular... Uh, I was over, it was a Sunday afternoon, actually. I was over at a buddy's house. We were watching NFL you know, football games all day and drinking beer and just doing what you did in college, or at least what we did. And been a lot of pot smoke and all of that. Well, it gets to be late, a lot later than I intended to stay. It's like, you know, 8.30, 9 o'clock at night on a Sunday. I got to work the next day, go to school. And I realized I can't drive at this point. You know, I've had too much to drive. And there, this was way before for all you young people that might be out there. It was before Uber and, you know, whatever the other ones are. You know, come get me app or whatever they call them. Yeah. You know, there was none of that. And Memphis didn't have cabs. So, hmm. you know, I started getting up and walking around and looking for guys in the house. Like, hey, is anybody okay? Drive me home or at least, you know, take my car home follow me. And I hear these voices in a room, bedroom, the door kind of cracked and so I opened the door to go, hey, guys, to ask them what I was going to talk about, you know, a ride home. And there's lines of cocaine on the dresser. I've never seen cocaine before other than in movies, Scarface, stuff like that, you know. And I just went, oh, wow. You know, that was always the drug that you, you just 
you don't want to do, right? You do that when you're done, right? You're hooked. Um, and one of the guys saw me, he said, well, you might as well come on in here now. You know, we've been doing this forever and you didn't know about it. We didn't want to tell you, you know, we still didn't trust you that much or whatever at the time. So I wound up, you know, walking over there, looking at it and had one of those moments where like, I had a flashback to my parents' car where I'm telling them I'll never do drugs. I'll never drink. I'll never, I'd broken all of that. But for some reason in this moment, this is like, you're making a choice in your life here that just alarms went off. But because I was intoxicated, I wanted to go home. I bent over and took a line, right? And it felt like my body was going to explode. I never felt anything like that in my life. My heart started beating heavy. I felt like I could run through a wall. Finally, um, I sit there down on the couch for a while because I'm just literally like, you know, a paranoid, you know, person at the time. Yeah, what, what at is, I mean, as somebody who's never done kind yeah. of hard drugs, what does Coke do to you? And well, is it the same with everybody or do different people have different reactions? Different people have different reactions and, it, you know, sensitivities to it like anything else you would take. But I just remember the first time it's just like jumping out of an airplane or something you're just like whoa you know and your body's coarse and your heart's beating heavy you get a hot feeling yeah you, you want to just talk 90 miles okay. an hour Yeah, because with pot which was my only experience yeah. as a teenager you would just sort of sit around and just talk slowly and listen sure, to music yeah. if people Eat doing, a lot of stuff yeah exactly <laughs> if people are sitting in a room doing coke what's the energy what what how are people well, interacting usually you have somebody's got cigarettes everywhere and people are lighting cigarettes like they didn't just smoke one okay like it's just you always you have you want something to do with your hands. You're just it's nervous energy. Mm. You're basically like people that take Adderall and things like that. It's mm. basically it's an upper. So your whole body is just so racing sitting and around looking doing for nothing stuff. isn't what you do after right. cocaine. Then well, people did it because <clears throat> you couldn't go outside and act like a crazy hey, person. Hey, hey. Like you're running in place outside. People <laughs> might find that like a little unusual in your front yard. What's Johnny doing? You know, yeah. there's even not even a treadmill there. Why is he running in place? So, so you just you. You sat there, but it was just, I remember it was very uncomfortable because people would talk and then you go through times where nobody would talk and you could see people looking around to see who's going to say something. It's just weird. Mm. Whole scene. But your body immediately craves it. Like you do one, you want another after really, a little while. Because yeah. you go up and you come down. You go uh. up and you come down. So that's how you wind up up at eight in the morning when you were like, I'm just going to do one line. And 12 hours later, you're sitting there with, you know, bloodshot eyes and staring out a window with the sun up, you know. Mm. And so that's how that started. You know, I, I got home that night um, and I told myself I would never do it again. You know, I was like, that's it. Like, I, that was dumb. Uh, I'm at a job where my dad works. If I get drug tested, like, what's that going to be? You know, what would that mean for him and how embarrassing it would be? Yeah. But that next Friday night, I was hanging out with the same guys and I walked into a different house, but same guys. And it's out there on the coffee table now. Like, they weren't even hiding anymore. Like, come on in, man. And I sat down and I was like, I really probably should go. But I didn't. And I, I bent down, I took another one, and I did a lot that night. And I told myself when I woke up the next morning, I wouldn't do it again, right? And how many times have we said that mm -hmm. in our life with porn or anything yeah. else, right? I won't do this again. Well, I made these rules up in my mind, like I won't buy it, right? I won't have the guy's number. I'll never do it by myself. I'll, I'll just, you know, keep this to myself and, and do it when they have it. And that'll keep me insulated. Yeah. Didn't work that way. You know, we, we would go over to this guy's house. And we'd sit there and, you know, we have Bill Street in Memphis where all the bars are downtown and the girls would want to go down there, listen to music, and then you'd hope that you'd leave with one of them. You know, we were all promiscuous at the time, you know, mm -hmm. we were doing all this stuff. And so that's what we'd say. We'd go over there and go, hey, this is it. We're going we're gonna to sit here. We're going to do some of this. We're going to drink. The girls will go out about 11. We'll go meet them and then see what happens. Very quickly, it became sitting there all night. We just quit going. And we all started developing a problem. People in the fraternity pulled away from us. They kind of got wind of what was going on. You know, this guy, these guys are doing that thing. And so anyway, um, it got to the point where very few of us, there was only two or three of us left. And I was doing it in my life all the time of that. I was successful in my job. I moved up to being a salesperson. I was making over six figures at like 24 years old. Wow. I dropped out of school. My dad basically said, yeah, no more of these goose eggs. I'm not paying for them, right? So. Mm -hmm. So he said, you go to work full time. Um, I quit hanging around the fraternity because I kind of aged out. You know, nobody liked the tall, older guy in the corner that was <laughs> hanging out with the 18-year-olds all doing the same thing. <laughs> so, you know, with all the Coke mouth jacking around and all that, you know, the guy's just kind of creepy looking. So I quit going to that stuff. And um, it was a very lonely time in my life. You know, I, I, I didn't really have many friends anymore. I was doing this on my own all the time. You know, I'd was living at my parents for a little while mm. and I was doing this in my bedroom. So you're you know? buying it at this point? Yeah, I was buying it, buying it. I had the guy's number. I started breaking all of those things I said I wouldn't do. Well, 
I mean, it, it's the thing about that drug is it's so isolating. You're one paranoid. You think you're worried everybody's going to find out. <sighs> and so the worst part of it is just the lying that's involved. You're always lying to people. You're always hiding something, which means you're also pulling away from people. You're not going out. You're not doing things. You're isolating, which is exactly where the devil wants us in our lives. You know, is away from people and on our own. We're easier to take out that way. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, I, I hadn't had a girlfriend in forever, um, and I was really lonely in that regard. And I started, you know, praying to God. At that point, we still had some sort of conversation going. I wasn't going to church anymore, but I still talked to him. And I said, "Please put somebody in my life." Well, this one night, my sister's in town. We go to a bar, and I'm hanging out with those guys again. And uh, for some reason that night, all of them are going to leave at like 6.30 at night. I got my bag of Coke. I'm ready to party, you know, and and wait for my sister to leave so, you know, we could start the fireworks and all that stuff. And all these guys want to leave. Well, I'm sitting there going, well, what am I going to do? And this girl walks in the bar who I'd known in college, actually dated, a, you know, a, a one of my really good friends at the time for years. Oh, she dated a friend of yours. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, she dated a guy um, for five years. I thought they were going to get married. Yeah. And so she was always just my boyfriend's friend, uh, you know, girlfriend. Yeah. I'm, I'm, excuse me, I said that really backwards. <laughs> I don't have a boyfriend. Sorry, that's weird. Please hear that again. I do not have a boyfriend. But <laughs> Your friend's, my friend's girlfriend. girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, excuse me. Wow. Yeah, it's funny. Sometimes you'll catch yourself yeah. just after saying something wrong, and then you, you're aware that there must be a lot of times that you say something wrong and not yeah. catch it and then you become terrified of all the things that are now yeah, on YouTube. Yeah, please don't put memes out there with <laughs> me and a saying boyfriend or something like that. But no, they, you know, she walks in, <clears throat> knockout girl. You know, I'd seen her a couple weeks before at a restaurant with my parents. Now I'd filled out, I had a crappy goatee at the time, I think. And like, I looked a lot bigger than the, the, the beanpole kid I was at the time in college. So she didn't recognize me. We were at this restaurant and I said, hey, Angela, and and she just kind of looked at me like, why does he know my name? You know. Oh, okay. And she came by the table a couple times, and I said something to her again. And she just kind of looked like, who's this weirdo that knows me and I don't know him? Well, that night she walks in the bar, and we're playing Golden Tee Golf or something, me and all the guys. And she says hi to every one of them but me. And I'm starting to get angry at this point. I'm like, what did I do to her where she just doesn't speak to me? So I go sit down, my sister leaves, and, and this girl that knew me uh, comes over and says, hey, the girl at the table wants to talk to you. And of course, I was angry because she never spoke to me. I was like, Why, what does she want? Mm-hmm. Like She never speaks to me, and now she wants to talk to me? And she goes, she, you know her? And I go, yeah, I tell her it's John Edwards. And so she goes over there, and I see my now wife Angela's eyes get this big. And, you know, the girl comes back over and says, she wants you to come talk to her. And I'm like, about what? What does she want to talk about? I'm a complete idiot at this point. I get up, I go to the table, I sit down, we start talking. And one of my only buddies that was left in the bar comes over and says, hey, man, we're going over to this other bar. Yeah. I was like, cool, man, I'll go with you. And he's like, <laughs> no, you need to stay. You know, and she's over here, he's over here, and I'm here at the end of the table. And I'm like, why would I stay? You're leaving. What is there here for me to do? Like, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be pretty lonely and bored. And I'm, these drugs ain't going to do themselves. I need somebody to help me with this, right? Yeah. So um, he says it again, and he starts, like, nodding at her, you know, like, hey, moron, like, follow my head nod. And I look over, and she's looking at me, and, and I said, do you want me to stay or something? She's like, yeah. And I went, oh, oh. Oh, oh, and then all the, this is my friend's ex-girlfriend, like all that went through my head. But we had a wonderful conversation. We hung out all that night and just, I never talked to a girl like her, you know, just the conversation we had. And so we wound up going and meeting them at the other bar, having a couple drinks, went home. And the next day I asked her out and we started dating. You know, I still couldn't believe that she was interested in me. But um, we dated for a year and we decided we want to get married. And at this time, Matt, like I had, you know, was fully doing cocaine when I was around her, when I wasn't, you know, I just, it become like somebody going home and opening a beer to me, except I was opening a lot of beers at that time. Uh, I was drinking heavily. She had no idea, you know, I was hiding it well. Are you dating at this point? Yeah, we're dating. Not married yet. No, we're dating at this point. Uh, we decided to get married, and I'm thinking this is it, right? This is the time of my life. This is one of those moments where you yeah. got to grow up, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Kids' gloves off, time to grow up and, and become a man. And I surely thought I would do that, but I didn't. I didn't. I was I was doing it right after our honeymoon, right when I got home, um, hiding it. You know, from the outside looking in, I was a guy that had the, the world by the tail. I had a beautiful wife, big house, nice cars, plenty of money. You know, I was a chameleon among men, if you will. You know, I could be anything to anybody at any place. That's how I was a good salesman. You know, and and what was your relationship with Christ like during this time? It was were not there, good. 
with it. Their, I can tell it wasn't good, but yeah. were, there, <laughs> were there little sort of prayers you made occasionally? Was there a desire to go back to church, to read the scriptures, yeah. since you had such a profound experience of that as a young kid? Sure. Well, first of all, the reason I'm Catholic now is because my wife was a cradle Catholic. Okay. And so she said in a conversation sometime, like, the man I'm going to marry will be Catholic. And so I was like, well, I guess I got to do that, right? Because uh-huh. I love this woman. And I thought it was very chivalrous of me to lay down my faith that I wasn't even participating in, <laughs> you know, to show my love for her. <laughs> you know, and so um, I did that, and and she took me to mass, and I guess I always had, you know, the ringings of all the Baptist stuff in my head, like they worship Mary and mm-hmm. they worship statues and Catholic Church is the devil and that kind of stuff, and and so I, I had some of that. My mom was so sweet; she was just like, "I just want you to go back to church. So if it's there, then then I'm happy for you." So Angela and I would go to mass, and after a while, you know, it's that phase kind of wore out where you're, you know, trying to impress everybody and you start being yourself again, right? Mm. You, you just sort of let old habits creep in. So it always was a fight, you know, to go to mass. I didn't want to go most of the time. I was hungover. Um, after, all that stuff. After you got married, was there a period in which you tried to quit the cocaine and drinking? Yeah, what, there was. What there was, was that a like, lot. and how did you slip back into it? It was hard, man. Honestly. Um, I was listening to Howard Stern one time because I used to listen to him all the time, and there was a guy he had on there, Artie Lang, was a heroin addict. You know, I mean, he was multiple, multiple times in, in problems with it. And he asked him one time, he's like, "Why can't you stop?" And he said, "My normal, I'm trying not to mess this up. I want to quote him right. He said, your normal is my feeling sick, right? When I'm not on this drug, I feel like I'm at my worst. I feel like I'm going to die. I feel like I'm going to vomit." Oh and that's when gracious. you've done this so much, yeah. like your body just gets attuned to it and yeah. it wants it. Like I could go to work. I could stay up all night long, like go to bed at 4.30 in the morning, had 20 beers the night before, smell like the pack and a half of cigarettes I smoked, you know, brush my teeth, take a shower, get up, put on my clothes and go to work and, and sell stuff all day long. But at 4.30 or 5 in the afternoon, my body started just – Craving it. Yeah, craving like it. Like coffee in the morning. Right. I just go like, I got to get out of here. Like, I got to go get this. And how much do I have at home? And I'm going to stop on the way. Sorry, just I just compared sure. coffee to Coke. Clearly, That's it's right. a lot more intense. It's <laughs> coffee right. in the morning. I, I can do with a cup. That's it wasn't right. like that. It was, Your Starbucks yeah. has nothing on my cocaine. <laughs> no, but it, it literally was that. Like, I would feel sick. I would tell myself, like, I'm going to go home. I'm going to be a good husband tonight. We're going to watch a movie. I'll make dinner. Yeah. And I'd get, like, halfway to the house, and my body would just start retching. Like, it just, my stomach. And hmm. I go, like, how am I in the thoughts? Like, 90 to nothing what are you going to do well, what if you don't have this and like what do you all you do is drink and smoke cigarettes and all those things what are you going to do when you get home now and how's this going to go down and what are you even going to talk about and just like that yeah. and i go okay i'm going to turn around and i'd go yeah. get the drug so you never could get over it and i would have those moments where to answer your question i go like jesus i, I know this is what i'm supposed to do in my life and i really feel like i'm getting a little bit far beyond my own control like i I'm buying this every day now, right? There, there's no, and I was hiding it, right? Because I ran the bank accounts. My wife never did any of that, so she didn't see the forty dollars coming out every day. Mm-hmm. Or if she did start looking at it, then I'd go to Walmart and I'd start buying something, get cash back, you yeah, know, and yeah. start hiding stuff. Yeah. But I, you know, I prayed a lot, but I don't think I ever really meant it, right? I don't think I ever really wanted to give it up. So, Angel and I, you know, we're married, we're going about life, and uh, pretty soon she tells me we're going to have a child. You know, and this is something I look forward to in my life. You know, I wanted, I wanted a son, and that's what I got. My son Jacob, he turns twelve this Friday. Mm. Um, joy of my life. I always wanted to be a dad. You know, my dad was a good dad, but he was a real strict. You know, disciplinarian worked all the time, taught me how to do things, but didn't continue doing them with me. Mm. And I kind of always grew up going like, when I have a kid, it's gonna be different. I'm gonna do everything with him, and and so I thought this is it, right? Another one of those moments. I'm a dad now. I can't be doing this stuff. Didn't stop. You know, uh, shortly after that, my mother had had found out a couple years prior that she had, uh, you know, contracted cancer, breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And for a couple of years, she'd go in, it was in remission, she beat it, they would take out a spot. Then it went into her lymph nodes, you know, and I kind of, I didn't know a lot about cancer, but I knew like that's not a good place for it to be because it'll travel other places. But she always seemed to be doing well. Well, around that time after Jacob was born, uh, she was going to the doctor one day, and I just had this inclination to go. It was like, I need to go meet her. They'd driven up to Memphis to go, and I'd never been to a doctor's appointment with her before. And, you know, my mom always wanted me to stay late for Thanksgiving and Christmas, but I always had to get back to the party, right? I didn't want to miss anything. And so um, I go to this doctor's appointment. don't even know if they're still going to be there. I walk in, and my mom and dad are in the room, and they're like, what are you doing here? And I told them I just felt like I needed to come be here. 
about three seconds after that, this female doctor walked in that had been my mom's doctor the whole time, and she looks up and she says, I'm sorry to tell you all this, but it's moved from your lymph nodes into your lungs and now into your brain. And you have, uh, you know, two, two weeks to a couple of months to live. And, man, I just, I'll never forget that day. Like, I, it felt like somebody stabbed me in the heart, you know. <laughs> Here's my dad, this man that never, I never saw cry. I like, never showed a lot of emotion, just break down. Um, all the times that I avoided doing, spending extra time with my family for drugs and alcohol and partying, I just realized, like, I'm never going to be able to get this time back. You know, that I took for granted for so long. This wonderful mother I've had has just has begged for my attention and I haven't given it. And so they load up and they still had a house in Midtown Memphis they were about to sell. They'd built a, a house down on a farmland we have where they're from. And so my dad said, we're going to go back there and pack up for the weekend. And I followed him. I didn't know what to do, right? I was just coming in between work calls, you know, sales calls. And so we go to their house in, in Midtown and pull in the driveway. My dad goes in and he's getting their stuff. And my mom's in the car and I just open the car door and i'm like mom i i've been thinking about what to say right the whole ride over there what do you say and i start crying i was like mom i love you and and i'm so i don't want you to die you know all that stuff and and you feel so helpless and at the same time i felt myself like craving to do drugs right this whole time i'm trying to be like this just irreplaceable time i have my mother and in the back of my mind i'm still thinking about i need to get home and do drugs but I'm sitting there talking to her, and my mother loved Jesus, right? And she just, she's like, John, I've been preparing for this ever since the day that I, they told me I had cancer. I knew there was a chance of this, and and everything's going to be all right. You know, you're going to be good, and, and your sisters and your dad are going to be good. And I'm just like, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that, right? I don't want to be good. I don't want to be without you, right? I don't, you know, and I was so angry, and she just said, John, I, I know you're hurting. We're going to go to the farm right um my dad had gotten back in the car at that point you know he's just a mess he doesn't know what to say and i'm afraid if i say something to him he's gonna like rip my head off you know because he's dealing with it too and and i just said bye mom and she said would you please you know tell your sisters so now i got the way to tell my sisters that my mom's gonna die you know so they pull out of the driveway and they had this big tall porch with these center block kind of decorative stuff on the bottom and i just remember running up and kicking the porch as hard as I could, which was not smart because <laughs> obviously center block is a lot, you know, better than my size 16 foot is a lot harder. So after I got over the initial stupidity of that, I looked up and I was just like, God, I hate you. You know, I hate you. That was the end of my relationship with Jesus for 10 years of my life with God, the father, all of it. I said, if this is the type of God that you are, I don't want anything to do with it. Why does a scumbag, lying, loser, drug addict, cokehead like me get to live? And someone like that who has loved you without fault have to die. If that's the type of God you are, I will, I will never worship you again in my life. And I meant every word of it. And Matt, I, I thought I was bad before I fell into a spiral. You know, like I didn't know how to deal with my emotions because, you know, I love my dad, but he was from – a farm raised family, six kids that were basically farm hands, you know, won a lot of, a lot of hugs and I love you's and I'm proud of you's. So there was never emotion. It was always met with like, why are you crying? Why do you need to talk about this? You're a man. You're going to be a man. You need to figure out how to deal with things. People have their own problems. You know, you need to work hard, never complain, put your head down, all that stuff. And so I didn't know how to deal with it. So what I did was I dove even further into the drugs and the alcohol. You know, the only time I would ever, Angel would ask me all the time, are you okay? Do you need me? I'm fine. I'm fine. I don't need anything or anybody. You know, Mr. Tough Guy, one-man army crap. And so the only time I would ever get emotional was, like, I would get in the shower in the morning and turn up, like, the, the speaker, and I would bawl my eyes out, and I would punch the tile of the wall and just curse God and all this stuff. And it just got bad, really bad, man. At that point, I was staying up to, like, 2 o'clock at night every night. My wife and I's relationship just went to nothing. You know, it was like I would come home, cook dinner, do things to, so she wouldn't gripe. You know, play with Jacob for a couple of minutes, but then I'd be onto the lines and hiding in the bathroom doing them, coming out, drinking, you know, 18, 20 beers a night, you know, all this stuff. And and uh, she came to me one day and she said, you know, I'm pregnant again. And, you know, I always had the concern in the back of my mind that here I am doing these drugs and what kind of effect is it going to have on my children? I was so lucky once with Jacob, but now, you know, she called me one day. I was at the zoo with Jacob and we were looking at gorillas or something and he was three and uh, she had told me, she works at St. Jude's Children's Hospital, and she said, there's a friend of mine that's going to do an ultrasound that day. And I forgot about it during the day, and she called and said, 
hey, John, I got the results of the ultrasound. She goes, there's two heartbeats. I said, yeah, yours and the baby. And she goes, no, that would be three. We're having <laughs> twins. And I think I said, do you know how much daycare is going to cost? It was like my response immediately, you know? And I just went, oh, my gosh. Like, we're, I'm going to be a father to twins, and I've got this little boy who's now like 40 yards off because I'm so dazed by the fact. Like, you know, Jacob's going, two, He's in the gorilla two. pen. Yeah, that's right. I'm like, yeah, two gorillas, you know. That's all I was thinking about. So I get home, I apologize for, you know, talking about daycare and all that and just tell her how happy I am that this is going to happen, but still a concern, right? What are they going to come out like because of the what I'm doing? And they come out perfectly healthy. Allison and Caitlin, my eight-year-old, you know, beautiful red eye, red-haired, blue-eyed girls, um, joy of my life. And I thought, this is it again, right? This is it. I'm going to be done with this. I'm going to – I've got three kids now. Like, Angela has a full-time job. She can't handle all this herself. This is my reason to stop. I didn't stop. I was so selfish, man. That's the thing. Like, we're all innately selfish. I mean, we all know that. You know, we want what we want. And when you start doing things like drinking all the time like I was, you know, snort coke all the time, like it just feeds that selfishness. And everything else goes by the wayside. It's like you feel yourself, I want to be a good man. Like, I want to be this husband, but I also want what I want. You know, and it was the little things like we're going to go to the restaurant I want. We're going to watch what I want. We're going to, it's my money in the bank account. Why did you spend $100 at Target when I was spending, you know, $250 a week on cocaine? You know, just I, that sort of stuff. Yeah. I, I heard you say that the worst part of the drug addiction was the lying. Mm -hmm. talk, talk to that. Yeah, it is. I mean, imagine, imagine being in like a, a glass cage where everybody can see what you're doing but you're lying like you're just constantly trying to make up something to, to show them something different you know i had the pressure of work with all this this these customers i'd built up i was a 100 percent commission sales guy hmm. so at any time i could lose everything i had you know and it would we would lose our way way of life that we'd built up and all those things so i was always having to lie to them and and you know, days where I would feel like absolute garbage and I'm going in there and having to put up this false front there, you know, with friends that could tell there was something different about me. Um, but I was always having to lie to that. Ansel would always say to me, why are we always sitting here on the couch watching TV? We never go do anything anymore. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, well, I don't need to do anything. I have you and like I have this. And But it was I was so afraid that if I went out somewhere and I was doing drugs, somebody would be like, what's the matter with them? Or my, you know, my mouth would twitch in a weird way or my you know, pupils would be huge and people would start to like catch on to what was going on. Did Angela have any idea during that? No, time? she knew something was going on, but in a way the devil provided a perfect cover for this with my mother dying. Cause she just thought like, he's really messed up over his mom dying. And I, you know, that's why he's drinking the way he is. That's why he's just rude and he's angry and he wants what he wants. And that's some of the stuff I was the most ashamed about was I had this wonderful woman and I treated her like garbage, man. Like I, just the way I, I talked to her, like she just didn't have any sense. You know, why are you asking me something like that? You already know the, it's just, I was a terrible husband, you know, and still expected all the other things that, you know, you would want from a wife, you know, to be treated the mm -hmm. way I certainly wasn't treating her and my kids. I was a good, I was a good, you know, father when I wanted to be, which was very rare. You know, because I was still concerned about myself. So, you know, I, I just, she knew something was going on, but she didn't know what. And so, man, there was this one night, you know, I'd started praying a little bit again, which I didn't like doing. I felt like, I like, what are you doing? I, you hate God. You know, he, what has he done for you? What's he going to do for you? But it was more of like something or someone helped me stop this because I started to realize I couldn't stop on my own. You know, sitting there at 2 in the morning, you realize you have a problem, you know, watching some replay of ESPN that you're not even looking at. At that point, I, I developed a problem with pornography, too, because, you know, with cocaine, you know, it has different reactions on different people. But when you're doing a lot of it, a lot of your bodily functions don't work the way that, you know, you would want them to. Mm. But it also feeds the, the inhibition of wanting that to happen, the desire there. Gotcha. So you're in a crazy place with that. And I was afraid that I would go back to the bedroom and wouldn't be able to 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 perform, if you will, and and uh, my wife would be like, what's the matter? Why does this keep happening? So I just retreated into pornography because I still had the desire, right? Like I, I want, you know, to to be satisfied. And so I found myself, you know, a lot of nights at two in the morning in a dark room of my house watching porn and hoping like one eye down the hall, hoping my wife wouldn't come down and catch me, mm. you know? So one addiction into another. And I was just in a terrible, terrible place. There was times where I, you know, I contemplated suicide you know, like my kids and my wife deserve better than this. You know, you don't think about what it would put them through because, again, you're selfish. 
So one night I'm sitting there like two in the morning and, and I'd had some customers calling all night and tell me they're going to, you know, quit our business because they looked at a price sheet wrong or something. And, and I had that pressure. And so I was just throwing myself into the drugs even harder than normal. About two in the morning I got up and I went back to bed. And, you know, you ever done cocaine, it's like impossible to go to sleep on. It's just ridiculous. That's the worst part of it. You're laying there in the bed for hours after you lay down, and you simply can't go to sleep. It's like your eyes have toothpicks propping them open. Wow. <laughs> it's horrible. So that night, for some reason, I could go to sleep, like, really quickly. I passed out. And, man, like 20 minutes, 30 minutes later, I felt myself come up out of bed, hmm. and my heart was just doing this. And I realized, like, oh my god, oh my god, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a heart attack. Like, this is, this is it. Like, all these after school specials you see, this is the moment. Like, I knew this was coming. I knew if I messed with this this long, and now I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die right here in my bed. And, and I looked over, and Angela hadn't woken up, so I kind of rolled out and landed on the carpeted floor, and you know, kind of looked up to see if she, you know, could see me. Because again, I was concerned about losing everything, and so the fact that I was gonna die. So I crawl into the bathroom, and I crawl up on the commode. And my heart's just steadily doing this, and I'm rocking back and forth, and going, "Man, I can't, I can't go out like this. I'm gonna, you know, my kids find me like this, my wife." <sighs> and I felt like I needed to tell her to call an ambulance, and I just said, "No, I'd rather die right here than have to deal with everything that will happen." Mm. You know, the, I'll lose her, lose the kids, lose the house, I'll lose my job because they'll everything. find that she'll find out you're an right, addict, and she'll leave me. Yeah. She'll leave me. She'll have. She'll finally have her answer. Right. She'll put the finger on yeah. what she's known's wrong. So I felt myself, one part of myself, going, I need to I need to ask God. I need to ask God for help. And then the other side's like, no, don't ask that. You know what for anything. And so I, I grabbed a towel. I put it on my face. And I remembered some after-school special, like, you know, one of the more you know things, like if you're having a panic attack to control your breathing. So I put a towel to my face, and, and, and all of a sudden I slowed my breath. And I thought, okay, this is it. I'm done with cocaine. I'm never doing this again. I crawled back in bed counted my blessings, if you will, that my wife didn't find out. Got up the next morning, threw out the drugs, went to work, 4.30 that afternoon, I was back behind them again. My body was literally retching. Like I vomited out the side of the car because of how bad my body was wanting this and me telling myself I was denying myself I wasn't gonna do it. It wasn't having any of it. And so I went and I got more. Same thing, two in the morning, watching my porn, go back to bed, fall asleep quickly. Same thing happens again the next night. Heart's doing this. I fall out of bed, same scene, get in the bathroom, except this time I go, all right, I don't know how many strikes I'm going to have, right? Like, generally you get three, but I don't know. I hadn't been a very good person. Uh, I might have two and a quarter or something, you know? And, and so I just say, all right, God, like, I'm not happy with you, and I'm not saying I'm going to give in to you or surrender to you, but I need, I need some sort of help. And there was a men's conference, a Catholic men's conference in the Diocese of Memphis coming up that weekend. I had an uber Catholic father-in-law that was always like shoving Catholic stuff in your face. And it was like, oh, look, squirrel, you know? And there's mm -hmm. like, you know, different books he would give me. I went once five years before and Father Larry actually spoke then. And, you know, we were talking about that before the show. He had all that yelling and like be a man and all that. And it spoke to me. And I thought it was yeah. going to change my life. He gave me a book. And I underlined three, three, you know, pages of it and put it down and went back to the drugs, you know, back then. Well, I remembered that that was coming up and I thought, you know what, I've only been to confession one time, but it seems like that's a place to start. But At this was, conference. Yeah. And I was afraid to go <clears throat> to my parish, you know, because yeah. I didn't want the pastor. I didn't really understand, you know, that priest wasn't supposed to say anything and all that. My RCI class was terrible, mm. you know, and so... You know, I go, and I don't remember who was speaking. I didn't care. I didn't go for that. I wanted yeah. to just go to confession. So I'm walking down the hall, and I'm doing the walk of shame. You know, you look at all the names, like, no, I know him. No, he's friends with my father-in-law. No, no, no. <laughs> you know, and finally I get to some name from some place in Mississippi that was out of town. I was like, all right, I'll go in there. So I open the door, and there's this, like, kind of heavy set, older, crotchety-looking priest. <laughs> I'm like, I look, and he's facing the other way, and he's kind of grunting a little bit, you know? And I was like, I'm not sure door number one was the right opportunity. <laughs> but I walk in, yeah. and he's facing. There's two chairs facing each other, and I go sit down, and he's like, begin, you know? And I'm going, all right, this guy is not about small talk or anything. He just wants to, you know? So I start pouring out my, you know, everything. And this was the first time, Matt, that I told anybody the truth. And I can't explain the feeling of it. Like, it was just like somebody opened a floodgate, and I just poured everything out. I was crying and, and just couldn't hardly really get through it. And he's sitting there the whole time just kind of like, you know, taking it all in. And I get to the end, and I say, 
look, I want to stop all this. I want to be the man I should have been, but I don't want to get in trouble. I just don't want to get in trouble. And man, he went off. Really? He's like, what do you mean you don't want to be in trouble? Are you here for Jesus' mercy? Are you here for, for absolution? Are you here for forgiveness? Ah, he's screaming at me. And I'm like, hey, man. Like, I said, I remember. Maybe he just watched a Father Larry Richards That's talk right. and think, thought, this will be my new stick. That's <laughs> right. I was just like, dude, Jesus was much nicer the one time I went before you, right? Like, I don't remember him yelling at me like this. But I got it. I was like, all right, man, all right. I, I want forgiveness. Yes, I want it. I'm sorry for what I said. And he said, if you're serious, I'll give you absolution. So he did. I went home that night, and I felt like there was a bunch of stuff that had been lifted off of me. And I was like, all right, I'm going to be a different man. And I went out, and I poured the beer out. I threw, you know, flushed the cocaine down the toilet. And Angela must have been like, I don't know what the heck they did at that place, but it seems to be working. Hmm. And I lasted for four days. You know, uh, that week, uh, I'd been waiting on this big purchase order at work, you know, $200,000 sale to come through. And for some reason that week, wow. uh, I got the call. And the guy was like, John, you know, come down here. I'll sign the paperwork. And uh, you know, congratulations. So I go down and I'm going to make more money on that sale than I've made in a year. Yeah. You know, and my bosses are going to be like, you're the hero and all this stuff. There's going to be accolades and all these things. Well, I go do that. And then I'm driving up the interstate back to Memphis and I'm thinking I should celebrate. Right now, I've promised in that confession that I wouldn't do this anymore, right? That I'm done with it. And so I call this dealer like 30 times, and he won't answer. And I'm almost on the way. I'm supposed to go get my son Jacob for my father-in-law's. So I'm almost out there on the other side of town, and he calls back. And I turn the car around like the Dukes of Hazard, you know, like just full spin and headed back the other way. And I run in. I get the $40 I normally got, and I come out. I look down. I'm on zero on my gas tank. I'm not in a nice part of town, as you can imagine. So I'm just hauling tail down the street to get into a gas station. And I pull up to the pump and say, like, okay, great. I'm not going to run out of gas. And I hear this whoop, whoop. And I look in the rearview mirror, and there's a Tahoe in the DEA. He's filing out of it, you know, both sides of the car. They come up, rip me out of the car, throw me against it. I'm sitting here in my work uniform. People are watching everywhere. I got phones up, you know, and, and they throw me in handcuffs. Start yelling, where are the drugs? If you don't tell us, we'll tear your car apart. They were in my sock. I told them. They reached down there and grabbed them. Next thing you know, I'm face first into the back of a Tahoe. You know, it was going 100 miles an hour down to the organized crime unit, sliding back and forth, risk getting cut by the handcuffs, all those things. They take me in. They chain me to, uh, to a, a, a bench, you know, by my feet. And I'm sitting there going, what have I got myself into, right? Where's my life gone? And, but I'm still thinking I'm going to get out of this, right, because I'm a salesperson. I talk my way out of everything. And so I'm thinking, I'm going to get this guy in here. I'm going to make a deal. I'm gonna, I'll be out here in 20 minutes, right? I'm not even thinking my car's impounded and all this other stuff, you know, and so they come in, they shake me down, they start asking about who the guy is and all this stuff, tell me they're, they'll let me go if I say something. Well, they didn't do any of that, right? This other cop comes in, he puts me in a cop car to go downtown. I said, where are we going? He goes, you're going to the jail. You're not going home tonight. What are you thinking? So I'm sitting in the car in the back, and they pull in to drop me in in downtown Memphis. Now, down, Memphis is you know always in the top five of murders in the country. You know, it's just a rough place in a lot of parts of the city, and you do not want to go to jail there. Not that you want to go to jail anywhere, but, like, I would certainly would avoid that one, if at all possible. <laughs> so I'm sitting in this patrol car, and uh, there's this long line, and the cops are now mad because they were about to get off work, and now they got to wait for how many hours it takes to get in the line. So all of a sudden, this, this officer, he's a young guy, looks in the rearview mirror, and he says, hey, you, because there was another guy in the car, and he says, uh, you look like you've never been in trouble in your life. What's your deal? And I'm sitting here going, should I say anything? Because, like, I don't want to incriminate myself or anything like that. I said, man, I've never been in trouble in my life, right? This is the first time I've made some bad decisions. I'm so sorry about it. All I want to do is call my wife. It had been three hours since I've been arrested. Mm. By this time, I knew that she had to be worried where I was, and Jacob didn't get picked up and all these things. Uh. And so – you know, I said, I'm just worried about my wife. And he goes, well, you know, we're going to be here a minute. I can put it in park, get your phone out of the trunk, and I can call her for you. you can't, I can't uncuff you. I'll put it to your ear. And I'm thinking, like, what kindness this is in a moment. But also, I go, I don't know what I say to her. And he looked at me. I'll never forget those eyes in the mirror looking back at me. He goes, man, is this about you or about her? And I realized that moment how much of my life had always been about me. Like, our whole marriage had been about me. This is 11 years into my marriage, you know. This is 17 years of me doing cocaine, you know, something I thought I was going to do once. So, you know, he calls he calls her, puts the phone in my ear. She answers, oh, my God, oh, my God, where are you, where are you? And next thing I know, I just tell her, I said, Angela, I'm in the back of a police car in downtown Memphis about to go into jail. I've been arrested on a felony charge of cocaine. 
And I hear silence for a second. She says, I hate you. I hate you. I hope you rot in there. You know, and, and I, I start crying and she hangs up, but I also understood. Mm-hmm. Like she finally had her answer right, that missing piece of the puzzle. Yeah. And she was hurt. And I was honestly selfish again, worried about what was fixed to happen to me when I went into this jail. Right. And so they finally get to the spot. They let me out. They go in and take all my personal belongings and put you in this big drunk take room with all the people who've gotten DUIs and just. It was terrible, man. I saw people fighting. I saw a guy stab another guy. There was just, you know, people beating up each other. It was, it was horrible. Four in the morning, they come get me, and, like, this is when it started to get real. I've got, like, the, the whole, you know, mugshot thing going on and starting to realize this is going to get out there. People are going to know there's no way for me to hide this from my job or anything. So they take me back to get, you know, scrubs on and all that stuff, the jail outfit and your, you know, stuff you can have, toilet paper, toothbrush, all that. They give me another phone call. I call Angela at 4 in the morning, you know, and she goes, I don't care, John. I know you're in jail. I've got to take the kids to school in an hour because you're not here and hangs up. So I go get the stuff. I go change into the, cro- into the, into the clothes, right, which is amazing, too. I wear a size 16 shoe. So like, <laughs> I was not because I was like, what are you guys going to do with that, right? Like going to sew something together or duct tape them or whatever. And next thing I know, they come out and they're like, here's your shoes. And I'm like, you have size 16 Crocs? And the lady's like, yeah, and I forget that, like, I'm in jail and all this stuff. I was like, that's amazing. Like, I can't go to Target and buy shoes, but, uh, you know, we got to shop, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> so, you know, it was a little bit of joy in a very, very dark place in my life. You know, I'm feeling great in my 16 Crocs walking around jail like I ran the place. But we get in this line, and we start to go down the cell block. And this is when I'm like, oh, man, what is this going to be? Am I going to be in one with somebody? You know, all this. I haven't slept in, like, 24 hours. I haven't had anything to eat. And so my mind's on, am I going to be in there with somebody i got to keep an eye on and not go to sleep, you know? So luckily I was in a cell by myself. They, they line us up in front of the cells, and you're sitting at this door, and it's starting to get real. You're just carrying, like, the four things you can have in your life. And the door opens really slowly. You say, inmate, walk in and turn around, face the door. And then I watch this thing. I could replay it in my head right now, just this very slow, just wrought iron door, boom, 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 boom. And then that lock hitting and just boom. It's over. Like, for the first time since I'm a kid, like, I can't go anywhere. If I want to go to the bathroom, it's in front of God and everybody. I can't eat. I, I have no power in my life to do anything other than to sit in that room. I'm six eight guy. You know, I'm in a six by six cell or something like that. I turn around and look, and there's a bunk set of bunk beds. And um, they're disgusting. Like, right, the mattresses are just, like, I didn't even know. I didn't want to know what was on there. Do you guys have fresh linens? That's right. You had Crocs. Do you not have a pillow or something or like a maid service? So I put down this one blanket and I lay down and thinking like, hopefully this is enough of a barrier for whatever's going on under there. Mm. I lay down face first and I pull the other one because we had two over me. And by the grace of God, I passed out. I had no idea. You don't have a watch. There's no clock. I wake up. I don't know what time it is. I'm still face down. And I'm thinking, oh God, what a nightmare. Right, like, thank you so much for 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 saving me for this. Like, oh, you were up thinking never, it yeah, was a nightmare. I thought it was a nightmare. I thought, it, I mean, I was face down under sheets. I thought I was in my own bed, you know, I mean, minus the gross stains and stuff and the weird <laughs> stuff, you know. And so I was <laughs> laying there, and I, I literally sat up, like, in joy, going, "Man, I will stop this!" Like, thank you for this. Like, you know, uh, what's the guy in the Christmas Carol? Like Scrooge, like yeah. has the night yes, of all yes. this. So what it felt like. And so I sat up, and all of a sudden, my head hit something metal. And I went, wait a minute, like, I don't have anything above my bed. And I look around, and there's this yellow, like, center block wall this far from me. And I start to look around, see the stainless steel toilet. I see the guy with, this guy had a, like, half caved in head across from me. He was a homeless guy that I used to see on the streets of Memphis. And he's sitting there just staring at me. And, like, all this is just coming to reality. And so I throw my legs over the side, and it felt like I did before with the heart, just, oh, my God, 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 this is for real. I'm going to lose everything. Like, I'm never going to be able to hold Jacob again. Angel will take them from me. I'm never going to be with her again. I'm going to lose my job. Everybody's going to know. I'm going to be embarrassed. My family's going to be embarrassed. I'm going to lose everything in my life. I'm going to be 37 and alone. And at that point, I started to look around the room for something sharp because I wanted to kill myself, you know? I, I, I just, I thought there's no way out. It's probably a pretty coward thing to do, you know? But I was like, I don't see a way out of this, you know? And so I'm sitting there, and I'm still shaking and rubbing night and nothing, and, and, and just one after another, the things I'm going to lose in my life, you know? My dad's respect, my sister's love, my, all that stuff. 
And then all of a sudden, this crazy feeling comes over me, man. And, and like, I can't describe it to this day accurately, but I just stopped moving. And this peace came over me that shouldn't have been there. I mean, I'm in jail, like, right? And I'm sitting there, and it felt like the weight of the world fell off my shoulders. And all of a sudden, out of my own, out of my own voice, like, I don't remember saying I'm going to say something. Like, my own voice comes out of nowhere and says, at least now I don't have to lie anymore. You know, at least now everybody will know who I am. And that's where the peace and the relief came from because that was, as I said, the worst part of my life was how I'm tired of trying to keep all this up. People would come to me and go, hey, John, remember when you said this? I'm like, what did I say? What did I say? What was it about? Is it something important? What if I told him this and now I'll say this? And and so the relief that came from like, now I don't have to tell anybody. Everybody's just going to find out. And so I started to just think, okay, I, I can't get out of here on my own, right? Like I, I'm here till <coughs> somebody decides they're going to let me out. So what can I do? I could start praying and hoping that I can become the man I was supposed to be. And I realized, no, I can't because I told God I hated him. Right? I walked away from him. I've, I've, I've scoffed at mass. I've, you know, all these things. And so I started to look at my life, and I realized that's when everything went downhill was the day that I joined that fraternity and I walked away from Jesus in my life. And so I hit my knees in that jail cell, and I just said, Lord, I'm sorry. Like, I'm so sorry. I I've blamed you for all of this, but it, it was me. I made the decisions. I'm the one that walked away from you. If you'll have me back, I'll do whatever you want. You know, I don't. I just want my family, I want my wife, I want my kids. Just give me an opportunity to do that. And and I didn't know what it meant. It had been so long since I had a conversation with him, I couldn't even remember how to do it. But I just kept saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And, and I felt that peace again. And I just said, I'm going to start thinking about what it means to be a man. Well, shortly after that, the cell door opens and nobody's there. So I'm like, what's going on? Did like somebody, is this a jailbreak? <laughs> you know, should I run? Should I stay still? <laughs> you know, and, and all of a sudden the, the bailiff comes down and says, you know, you got 30 minutes, make a phone call, take a shower, whatever you want. <laughs> you know, and when I heard the shower part, you know, I've seen a lot of <laughs> prison movies. So I was kind of <laughs> like, I'm good on that. Like, I just, I'll take the phone thing. Like, I'm pretty sure I want to stay, you know. I want to stay uh, away from the shower. So uh, unless you have soap on a rope or something like that. <laughs> you know, but, but no, seriously, I, I just sat there and, and I said, I'll take the phone call because I wanted to talk to somebody human. And like, I, I didn't realize I was claustrophobic until I was in that jail. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I'm just like, I got to get out of this place, right? Like, right. I, I can't stand this. And so they take me this phone. It's a box with speaker holes in it and no headset. Hmm. So I'm like, how do you use this? Like, how do you? There's people yelling and screaming at the cops and all the <laughs> terrible stuff, mm. you know? And, and so it was impossible. I'm just dialing stuff. I'm asking the bailiff. They won't tell me how to use it. I'm like, this is worse than hell. Like, I have a, a way to get out right here and I don't even, I can't use it. You know, it's like having a key that doesn't work. And so all of a sudden, this arm comes out. And there's a cell right by, beside me, which I hadn't even noticed. And it was this African American guy that sticks out this this toilet paper roll, and I'm thinking, like, what is that? <laughs> is there like a shiv in there too, or like? And and he hands it to him, and he says, "Put your ear to this, and you'll be able to hear." And I look back through the story, and like just the kindness that like this guy was in jail. I don't know what for, but he he wanted to help a guy he didn't know, mm. you know. And he handed me this toilet paper roll, and I start calling everybody I know, all those brothers for life, all the guys I spent all the money on, and you know, did all these things for. Nobody answered the phone. It is the most lonely I've ever felt in my life. I was like, I'm never getting out of here. Because Angela said she wasn't coming, right? So I called family. They wouldn't answer. Finally, I got a hold of my sister at my dad's house. And she says, John, I know where you are. We know where you are. Angela's um, Angela's across the street trying to bail you out, which really surprised me, you know, because I just didn't think she was going to do it. I thought she was done. And she said, she's not going to let you come home. Um, she's going to, you know, go to her parents' house with the kids. You'll be able to go home and get clothes because uh, you'll have court Monday and all this stuff, but you're going to, you know, I'm going to come get you and take you down to the farm where dad and I are. All I heard was you're getting out of here. So I was kind of celebrating. I did wind up taking the shower. So they were individual, <laughs> one at a person time. So I cleaned up and uh, I went back to the cell. And a few minutes later, the door opens again. And they said, you have a visitor. So I was pretty sure it was going to be Angela. I walked down. There's the law and order scene, the glass, the pay phones. And my mother-in-law's there and she's crying. I wasn't sure if it was tears of like anger and hate or sadness for whatever and and because she knew and had witnessed how i was treating her daughter you know verbally and things like that in my life at the time angela's crying she's crying i'm crying i'm just saying i'm so sorry i'm so sorry i'm so sorry and she says stop she said look i'm not going to divorce you but it has nothing to do with you it has everything to do with the vows i made to god in the church that day 
What a woman. I know. I mean, I, I, to this day, I, I still can't. The mercy she showed me in that moment and the grace that God poured out through her. Um, and it was just like being set free. You know, I was like, okay, I don't have to worry about that. And I just started, I'll be better. I'll do this. And she said, John, I paid your bail. You know, you're going to be out here at 930 at night. Your sister's going to come get you. Same thing my sister told me. And I said, I love you. And she just kind of turned around and looked at me and just, you know, nodded and walked off with my mother-in-law. And um, I made my mind up right then and there, like, I, I'm not going to get another chance. I don't know what it means. I don't know how to be a good man. I'm so broken, you know. I'm so <laughs> selfish and so lost. It's, I don't know how to find my way back, but I'm going to do my damnedest to, to figure it out. So I go back to my cell, and I sit there, and I pray, and I have a conversation with Jesus all day long. Like, And he's showing me, like, who I was when I was a kid and how much joy I'd found in that. And I started to realize how much of my life and how different I'd become and how much I missed him, right, how much I missed him. And so we have those conversations. It gets to be about 9 o'clock at night. Uh, you know, they take us to get all our personal belongings. I walk outside expecting to see my sister, and it's not. It's my dad. And I'm thinking, oh, you know what? You know, it's like I'm a, I'm a four-year-old kid again or eight-year-old kid that broke something in the house. You know, I'm way bigger than my dad now, but I'm thinking what's waiting for me when I get down to that car. And he's standing there, and he's looking at me. And I walk up, and I'm like, Dad, I, and, and he just grabbed me. <laughs> and he pulled me to him, and he hugged me, and he said, I love you. John, I love you. And I'm so sorry this happened. And he just hugged me. And, and man, mad as a kid, I would have killed for that, like, so much of my life. You know, I mean, he taught me how to play basketball, but I want him to be out there playing with me every day. You know, and it just he was busy, and he was taking care of us, and I get it. But like I would have killed to hurt. I'm proud of you. Any of that stuff. And in that moment, he tells me, he says, "Come on, let's let's get you home. Let's get you, you know, clothes." And I looked down at my phone. My job had called like 57 times, and I thought, "Great, now I got to call them." And and he told me, he said, "John, you got to call them. They're going to find out one way or another. You, you know, got to be a man and call them." And I was like, "Well, Dad, it's 10:30 on a Friday night. Surely they're busy and they don't want to hear from me." You know, <laughs> he's like, "Cut the crap and call your boss." <laughs> so I call him, and and uh, and my boss just said, "Look, I, I heard something happened. What happened?" I told him. He said, "All right. Well, are you okay?" You know, and I said, "Yeah, I'm fine. We're friends." And he said, uh, "You know, I hear you have a court date Monday." I said, "Yeah." And he goes, "You need to come see us after that." I said, "Okay, I'll be there." So my dad takes me to the house. I walk in the den where my kids are normally playing, and nobody's there. And I'm just longing for them, right? I like, could just, for this time that I'd walked past so much of my life, you know, and just thrown to the side because I wanted to do drugs. And now they weren't there. I could see literally like almost images in my head of them playing in there. Go back, get a suit, my dad, you know, in some clothes, and we go down to my farm. And it was the realest conversation I ever had with him. You know, he starts asking questions like, is this my fault? You know, did I do something wrong? Was I not a good dad? And the weight of that was crushing, man. I was just like, Dad, I'm a, I'm a grown man. I made my own decisions, you know, like this isn't your fault. And he started talking about my mom and the pain of losing her. And, you know, and, and we just had conversations about stuff that, you know, that tough guy mentality that we hadn't had conversations about. And so I really cherished that time, you know, with him. And, and I get up Saturday morning. By the way, I didn't mention this yet, but this went down on Holy Week. Like I was arrested on Holy Thursday. Wow. And I came out of jail on Good Friday. So don't think that the gravity of that passed up on me when I was in jail, right? Uh, and so we're sitting there on Saturday, and, and my aunts are showing up, and they're like 81, and they're wondering why my family's not there for Easter. And I told Jesus I wouldn't lie again, but like I didn't want one of my 81-year-old aunts to have a heart attack when I told her, like, I have a huge Coke problem, and I just, you know. And like, you know, they just started falling out like dominoes in there. I didn't want that on my conscience, so... I just told him, I was like, Angel's got the big Italian family, and they wanted to be there, and I haven't been down here for Easter and forever, so I just made the decision to come down here. The next morning, I get up. It's Easter morning, and I just have this desire to go to Mass. All I can think about is my wife is going to go to Mass with my children without me. She's going to be there with her family, right, this huge Italian family. They're going to all be in the kitchen like they always are. It's a five-foot kitchen, but 30 people will be in there, and, and she'll open the door, and all that noise will go, <gasps> because everybody knows and it'll be the elephant in the room and she's going to have to face that all by herself. And and so I just, I wanted to go to Mass. I was like, I can't think about any of that. I just want to go be with God. So there's this small Catholic room in this town of Bruce, Mississippi. It's got like 600 people in it. And we had gone one time like five years before. You know, I, I demanded to go to our families for, for my side of the family for Christmas. And she said, only if we go to Mass at that that Catholic room. That's really what it was. It was like a room in a building. Well, there was a, pa- a priest there at the time 
said hi to us that night. Well, I go for Easter. You know, I go to Mass. I show up at the same time, borrow my dad's car. I pull up and no one's there. And I'm going, are you kidding me? Like, God, this is the first time in 11 years I've wanted to go to Mass and I can't go. Like, what is going on? I start beating the steering wheel. I'm angry. I'm, like, smashing stuff in my dad's Kleenex box, you know, slamming it. And all of a sudden, this Jeep pulls up, and it's this this uh, nun that gets out. And she would do, you know, services when the priest wasn't there. You know, she had communion service, things like that. And so she gets out, and I'm, like, acting like a maniac in the car. And she looks over, and she's like, what's the matter with you? I'm like, I want to go to Mass! You know, I'm just <laughs> screaming. And she's like, son... There's too many people. It's Easter. You know, everybody's down the road at this 4-H club. You know, it's an agricultural building. Do you know where it is? And I said, yeah, we had a family reunion there a few weeks ago. And so I'm just overjoyed, right? I'm racing down this highway and pull in and, you know, go inside. There's all these families in there. You know, there's a big Latino population down there. And, and they were there with all their families. And I go in and, and, and I sit down. And it's rough, man, because all these kids are climbing all over their parents. And I'm just missing the stew out of mine. And the same priest walks in. He was a traveling priest, so you never knew if he was there or not. He worked like four different parishes on different weekends. And he gives this homily that's just amazing, you know, and he, the whole mass in English and Spanish. And I get up. They'd say they're having a potluck afterward. I'm like, no way I'm staying for that. I'm going to leave. I don't want to be around all the families. It's just hard. And so I get to the door, and there's a, a hand on my shoulder. And I turn around. It's this priest. Because like, who's touching me? I don't know anybody in here. And he goes, hello, John. And he remembered my name from like five years before meeting me one time. And he said, I don't know why your family's not here or where they are, but God wants me to tell you that everything's going to be all right. I can't tell you what that felt like. It's like, how could he know? What is he talking? Like, why would he even come say something to me? But I got in the car and I made my mind up. I was like, this is it. I'm changing my life. I don't care what it means. I went back to my dad's. The next morning we drove to Memphis. I went to court. I was put on diversion. There's a Catholic judge in Memphis that believes in giving people chances instead of you know, just continually sending them back through the same stuff. And so I would go and take drug tests every month. And, and as long as I was, you know, fine with that, then it would be off my record. I went wow. next to my work and uh, I went through a litany of, you know, all these HR people. What, and, what was that like walking into your place of employment, seeing <laughs> yeah. people, knowing they know? It what? was hard, first of all, because my father worked there for 45 years. So it's not just me walking in. My dad's driving me there. And I'm thinking, not only have I ruined my life, but I've embarrassed my father, right? All these years of hard work, and so many people respected him. And, you know, and I said that to him in the car. I was like, Dad, you don't have to go in. You know, just stay in the car, and and I don't want you to have to deal with that. And he's like, son, I worked here 45 years, and my reputation speaks for itself. You know, uh, this isn't on me. It's on you. And if they have a problem with that, then I don't care. I'm going to be here for you. Good for him. So we walked inside, and. I go in this room and you're surrounded by all these people with legal pads and somebody on the phone that I can't see that's questioning me and all this stuff from headquarters. And it's just, did you do it at work? You know, have you ever done it with a customer? Have you done, you know, all that stuff? And I'm going, yes, no, 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 yes, no, no. And they stop in the middle and they're like, you have to be somewhere? Like, do you realize you can lose your job? Like, why do you act like you don't care? And I said, there's a behavioral science center about two miles down the road. And I'm going there as soon as this is over because I want to prove to myself, I want to see how far I'm gone in this, but also I want to prove to my wife I'm serious. And they said, well, is this court ordered? I said, no, I'm doing it on my own. They didn't make me go to this. And so I said, so I'm sorry. You can fire me if you want. I've never been in trouble. I've never been written up. I've made you a lot of money. And I'll continue to do that if you'll let me have a job, but i got to go take care of this. And I got up and I walked out of the room wow. and, and left. And my dad took me down the street. And man, we went. I've never been to one of these places. So what are these? Places? Like a rehab? Or? Yeah, like behavioral science. Or there's one in Memphis called Lakeside. And it was crazy because when I was a kid, you know, in the afternoons, I was watching like cartoons and Three Stooges and stuff. Mm -hmm. And these like drug rehab commercials would come on in the middle. And I'm like, I'll never wind up there. Well, here I was, <laughs> like, you know, walking to the front door of one of these places, you know, 30 years later. And my dad's with me again. I go in, and, and I just start to see the condition of the people that are coming in. And I told my dad, I was like, Dad, I want you to I want you to stay in the car, you know, and I don't want you to see this. And so he did. He went and stayed in the car. I walk in. They take me to another waiting room. And man, I was sitting there, and there's this door over my right shoulder. Hmm. And these people just come in, and they've got their sons and their daughters, and they're methed out, and they're scratching themselves and bleeding because they think there's bugs on them and stuff, and heroin addicts, and they've got them by, like, the seat of their pants and their T-shirt, and they're just like, take them. This is 15 times. I'm done. I'm done. He broke everything in the house. He stole my car. He, I'm done with him. He's yours. I don't want him in my life anymore. 
and one was worse than the next. Like I was sitting there just in wow. tears looking at these guys just sitting oh before their gosh. families abandoned them in their and so there's this newspaper sitting there. I pick it up and, and I, I cover myself with it, right? I'm like, I don't want to see any more of this. And people just keep coming in, keep coming in. Well, finally the door opens and nobody walks by. Like the paper doesn't ruffle. And and I was like, what happened? And I, I lower the paper and my wife's standing there looking down at me. And we hadn't spoken since she was in jail and got up and left the, the payphone window thing. And so I, first of all, I'm going, Why is she, how does she know I'm here? And she's standing there and I said, Angel, what are you doing here? And she looked at me and she goes, I'm mad as hell at you, but I can't let you go through this alone. <laughs> oh, right? Angela, like, you beautiful woman. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting here going, I have mistreated and I have I have done more things wrong in my life to her than I'll ever be able to make up for. And here's this woman who, when I'm scared to death and I have nothing, I have no idea what's going on in my life. And she's standing here saying, I'm not going to leave you. And so she sits down with me, and we start talking. And she's like, "Look, I'm still mad at you. Don't don't get that messed up, right? Like I'm hurt, and but our children need you." Allison, which was one of my three year old twins, asked me yesterday if you were dead, because it'd been five days, six days since they'd seen me. I'd never been gone like that. Yeah. And we go back to get assessed, and they decide I need a 30 day outpatient program, which Angela completely disagreed with. She was like, "No, put him under this place. Is there like a room like below the concrete, and there's like torture devices and <laughs> things like that? Can you beat this out of him, like you know, something like that?" And so I'm like, "I think the lady knows what she's talking about. She's got a degree. She's professional. Like I would, I would just trust her." And uh, so we, you know, we get out of that. And we start walking back to the car, and I'm looking for my dad, right? Because I'm just thinking I'm not going home and feeling horrible because he's going to have to drive. Me two hours one way you know each way every day to get oh, me up man. here awesome. and uh which i know he would willingly do but i didn't want to put that burden on him and angela said where are you going i said i'm trying to find my dad and she goes well, i told him to leave you're going to come home tonight and i couldn't believe it because i just felt like i'd never be home again right like i just home seemed like a foreign thing to me now and i got in the car and i started showering her with like why are you doing this and why are you she said john i need you the kids need you like, I can't do my job and take them to school and pick them up, and you're going to be out of work. You can't go back to work till after your court date. So, you know, my father-in-law, who's, you know, he's not happy with you, but he'll let you borrow his car to drive the kids around until you can figure out yours. So we get home, and, man, like, I open that back door, and there's those kids in the den, you know. And at this time, they're, they're you know, they're not very old. They're, they're little toddlers, and, and, man, I hit my knees in that floor, and those kids tackled me, and we're rolling around, and they're daddy, 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 and – I'm crying everywhere, and I just thought, like, how could I have ever, ever taken this for granted? Like, right, I, I just, I didn't want to let go of them. Like, I literally had to sit there for, like, 30 minutes with them just in my arm, and they're craned around going, why are you hugging me? Let me watch Barney, you know, or whatever. <laughs> I'm like, I'm never going to let you go again. Well, you know, that night, Angela told me on the way home, she said, look, don't mistake this. When you come home, like, I'm not going to be able to sleep in the same bed with you. We're not okay. Like, I'm hurt, and uh, so I'll be sleeping in Jacob's room. Well, Jacob's room was across from ours, and on my side of the bed, I could see directly into it. So that night, the kids are in bed, and I find myself, like, overjoyed to be home again. I think there's air conditioning. There's not some weird guy staring at me. You know, there's a bathroom where I could shut the door, and, you know, just it's wonderful, joy, you know, joyful time. I can go make a sandwich and not have to eat pig slop or whatever it is. Uh, and so I'm thinking, like, yeah, I'm king of the castle again, and I look over, and I see this empty spot in the bed. And I'm like, you son of a, you know, you idiot. Like, here you are rejoicing because you have these things around you and you're not going to do drugs and, you know, drink like that anymore. But you have to be different. Like, this can't, you can't be okay with your relationship being like this. So I look across the hall and I see the shape of my wife, you know. Like, I, I you know, I used to say the lump of my wife and she wasn't very appreciative of that and asked me to change that. So the shape of my lovely wife um, under the covers. And I thought, I've got to be different. So what did that mean in my life? All I had as a as a you know a way to, to change my life when I was younger was Christ. So I started immediately looking for scriptures because you know I was Baptist growing up, and that's where I was where I found Christ the most in my life. God bless him. So I started looking for a Bible, and you know I looked on my side of the room. She so looked on hers because there was probably like sixty of them stacked up <laughs> over there. But I opened uh, the drawer and found that book from Father Larry Richards I mentioned was in right. the drawer. What was it called? Uh, be a man. Mm. Really great book. If you're a guy out there struggling with what it means to be a man, like it's real authentic masculine spirituality man it's it's great so i picked it up and i see where i stopped like five years before on the underlining <clears throat> i said that's not going to be me again 
And so I read that book from cover to cover. Like six in the morning, Angela gets up and she's like, "What are you doing up so early?" And I said, "I never went to sleep." You know, I, I can't be the person I was, and I know you probably don't believe me, and I know you're hurt, and I don't know how to fix this, but I'm going to do everything I can, you know, and, and I know you're not going to forgive me overnight, but I'm going to do my damnedest to be the man that you, you deserved all this time. You know, and she's like, yeah, okay, whatever, because she's just hurt, you know. And so that book showed me that I needed I needed Christ in my life again, you know, and so I was taking my kids to school one day. The world started to crash, and people started to find out about it, you know, just people gossiping. There's this one guy at work that saw me in, like, the Just Busted magazine, which, you know, that's that's not something I'm proud of. But I did make Just Busted (laughs) magazine, so you can go back to your local (laughs) gas station and see my smiling face on the front. So, But people found out, and next thing I know... Um, I started getting texts from customers like you, you son of a this, you piece of this, f you, what a piece of garbage you are. I'll never, I'll never buy anything from you again. I can't believe you lied to me all these years. You know, everything I'd done in friendship and relationship went out the window for a lot of them. Not all of them. I had some mm. good ones that, you know, were very loyal and and stuck with me through it. But I'm at I'm at school that day and I drop them off and all that comes in and I'm crashing them down. I'm in my father's suburban and I'm thinking, my life's never gonna be. Good so again. you were fired from your job? No, no, no. So I was still in this 30-day window okay. and I had to wait until the court decision of whether, you know, I was I pled not guilty, but you had to wait 30 days and then they gave a decision and all of that. So I'm sitting there in the car and I'm like, my life's never going to be different than this. I'm always going to be the guy that did coke and I'll never get away from that. And all of a sudden as I'm starting to kind of go down a downward spiral, I see this pas- the pastor of my church walk across the parking lot, Father James Martell. I didn't know him that well. You know, he'd come over and baptize my kids, had a beer and left, and so we didn't really have a real relationship. I go to that church, I open the door, I walk in, and I feel like the biggest hypocrite in the world, you know, because I'd never been to Mass. I was scared that I wouldn't know what to say, and it was going to be obvious. I'm six foot eight. I stick out like a sore thumb, so that doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't help. So I go in there. I'm on the Joseph side. I kneel down. I start praying. And for the first time in my life, there was like three old people in there and me, and I heard every word of the mass, like every single word. And I started realizing how much scripture was involved. I started realizing the beauty of everything that I'd taken for granted for so long, being obstinate, like I'll come to this, but I'm not really going to give my life to it, you know? And so he gets up, give hum- he gives a homily that, and the readings are speaking to everywhere I am in my life in that moment. And I'm starting to cry. And by the time he gets to the homily, I'm full on waterworks over there. Like just like, disturbingly bawling over there you know people are looking at me you can hear the hush of what's the matter with them and all that uh-huh. stuff and and so we get to the consecration and and, and i'm thinking well, i'm not going up there right like i'm not going up there i'm not worthy of this i haven't been to confession and he's looking at me and i'm in the front of the joseph side and, and he starts waving at me to come up and i'm like no and he looks at me and he's like come up and i'm just bawling I'm like, no and he looks at me again he says come here and I thought he's not going to give up, so I got to go. I'm holding up the, the line here. So I get up, and I go up there, and I'll never forget it. I put my hands out because I was never comfortable taking it on the tongue. And so I put my hands out, and he just looked at me, and he said, this is the body of Christ. And he put it in my hand, and as soon as it touched my hand, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it, but there was a feeling that went all over my body, and I was like, this is God. This is God. This is the God that has put me back with my family. This is a God who loves me, and I didn't really understand the extent of how much, <laughs> but I was like, he wants me here, and as much as I, as, as I don't want to be here, I don't feel like I should be, he's calling me here, and so I took it, and, and people may say it was unworthily, but I was doing what I was told at the time, you know, and he points to the blood, and I walk over there, and I'm like, no, and he starts the yes again, and so, I, you know, I, I partake in the cup, and I go back, and man, I just prayed. Like, I, I couldn't tell you what I prayed, but that was the hardest I ever prayed in my life. It's probably a bunch of thank yous and I'm sorry and thank yous and I'm sorry. And, and and I'm kneeling there and I'm just bawling. Like I'm not even trying to hide it anymore. Just this feeling I had all over me. And I prayed so hard mass was over. Like I didn't even get up again. Like I didn't realize that they had processed out or any of that. And I feel a hand on my shoulder again and it's this priest. And I look up and he says, John, what are you doing here? Which was a valid question because <laughs> you didn't see me at Sunday mass a lot and certainly not a daily mass. So he takes me back to the confessional. I see we're tracking there, and I'm like, where are we going? He's like, confessional. And I said, Last time I went in there, I wound up going to jail. Like, I don't know that I really want to go in there. Like, you Thank know, you, though. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a get-out-of-jail-free card just in case? So I go in there, and we sit down, and um, and we start going through it. And, Matt, I want to beat myself up. And I'm sure there's plenty of people that will watch this, and they know the feeling of you on confession, and you just feel dirty and so undeserved of any mercy. and. You start just beating yourself up with a hammer, you know, like getting your own stick and just, you know, tearing yourself up. 
And every time I would say something, but Father, you don't understand, right? I did this. I don't care about that. We've talked about that. God's going to forgive you for that in a minute. You need to get past it. You know, well, what about this? I, don't you see how terrible I am? Don't you see how undeserving I am? And he kept saying, John, stop. We're here to receive the Lord's mercy, and we're not going to dwell on these things. You're going to be a better man. And he kept telling me all of that. And we get through, and he gives me absolution. I get up to leave, and, and he's like, where are you going? And I said, I'm sorry, but I've only done this twice, but I'm pretty sure I'm supposed to leave now. And he said, sit down. I'm not through talking to you. And he said, John, uh, you told me that you're going to be in this program, so you're not going to work for, you know, another 25 days or whatever it was at the time. So I expect you to be here at 815 Mass every morning. Um, did you notice I read my own readings? I'm going to need you to lecture. And I said, okay, great. What the heck is a lecture? <laughs> and he's like, you want me to give a lecture? What is that? I don't know anything. you know." And, so, and so he he says, no, I'm going to teach you. I'm going to teach you how to read, and, and you're going to do that, you know, until I tell you any different. And then he said, and you'll be here every Friday after Mass to go to confession. Saved my life. You know, that priest caring about me. And, Matt, we don't – this is a side note, but I don't know that we do a good enough job taking care of our priests. That we, Amen. We, we, you know, we get we, – they're like a drive through window to us. You know, Father baptized my kid, give me this, give me that, give me that. Very rarely do we say, Father, what can I do for you? Hmm. You know, how can I be your friend? What do you need? You know, just a side note. That that relationship showed me that, that there's that there's a way that our priests need us. You know, he's one of my best friends. He's over every weekend, you know, and just I love him to death. But – so this goes on, and he starts encouraging me, and I find the Lord in the Mass and in the sacraments in a way that I never did before as a Catholic, if you want to call me Catholic. You know, I was used to say, like, I was Catholic for 11 years before I was ever Catholic. Mm. <clears throat> and uh, I wind up just putting myself in the Scriptures every single day. I'm reading hours on in at night. I'm praying my bed at 8 o'clock so my kids find their dad praying, and they see that example. I'm trying to worry about making Angela forgive me, but the Lord kind of made it pretty clear, like, you can't worry about that. I'll handle that. You know, you worry about my opinion and what I need you to do. So all of a sudden, I started remembering all this, all the Bible sword drills we did in, in you know, vacation Bible school. And God the bless the Baptist. Coming man. alive, man. And I'm, yep. I'm like feeling things in my life, and I'm knowing where to go to deal with them mm. and, and just going, oh, yeah, I remember this. And then I start being able to quote Scripture. And, I mean, I haven't picked up a Bible in 20 years or whatever, 17 years. And I'm just falling in love with the Lord. Like there was nights where I'd fall asleep on my bedroom floor just praying with the Scriptures open and a crucifix in front of me. And I started having this desire where I didn't want to go to my job anymore. All I wanted to do was just like, learn about God and love God and be a husband. And I was leading my family to mass, all these things. And Angela kept waiting for the other shoe to fall, right? Really? Like, where's, where's the, when's this going to end? Yeah. <clears throat> you know, but long story short, I went to that same men's conference next, the, you know, a full year. I read like 65, 70 Catholic books that year. I was running through them, Rome Sweet Home, all the way to, to uh, anything I could get my hands on that somebody said, read this. Yeah. And so... Um, I go to this thing like ready to receive in its fullness. I think Father Mike Schmitz was giving the talk, and he was great. Um, and then there was there was a, a focus missionary that got up there and was the witness speaker and poured his heart out about DUIs and coke and all this stuff he'd had wow. in his life. Wow. And it just the courage he showed just it blew my mind. So I found him afterwards, and I was like, dude, let me tell you my story. And I started sharing with him. And he's like, man, that's incredible. You should really open up to some people. And I thought, no, no, I'm not doing that. You know, I'll lose, I'll lose everybody in my life. That night, there was something in my parish, a fun fundraiser function, a basketball three point shootout, which I went to win. I did not win. <laughs> I overestimated my skills. I forgot I was 37 and not 18. But uh, I went in there, and there was this guy who had been at the same conference that day, and apparently right. he went to confession for the first time in 23 years. Yes. And this dude was running around like. <laughs> Like he, he was on code. Oh, dude, he was. Yeah, I was like, is he? You know, and, and, but he's jumping around and he's like, dude, I feel so great. Like I, I just, I went to this thing today and I, I talked to the priest. I went to confession. And whoa, you know. And he's just, it's some of the things he's saying. I'm like, hey, Jay, Xna on the shower, eh? Like you got to cleave some of this part. There's women and children in here, right? You got to calm down on some of what you're saying. So he comes up and he's like, I don't understand why I feel this way. And and I said, dude, you've had a Holy Spirit moment. And he goes, I'm cradle Catholic, and I still don't understand what he meant by this. But he said, I'm cradle Catholic. I know who God is and Jesus, but I don't know what the Holy Spirit is. And I said, well, and I started talking to him, and then all of a sudden the devil hit me with a hammer, man. It was just like, what are you doing, mm. you cokehead? You've been arrested, spent time in jail. You basically abandoned your family for 17 years, and you're going to tell somebody about Jesus? I originally just right away thought of that scripture in mm-hmm. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, where Satan is referred to as the accuser of our brethren yep. who accused them day and night before the throne of God, and he was cast down. Yeah. 
That's exactly right. I talk about that all the time when I'm yeah. t- speaking to men about this because he is, and the father of lies, right? He's 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 building those lies and accusing you of all those things. And so I stopped, you know, and he's like, well, keep going. I, why, why are you stopping? And I said, Jay, there's priests here. You, they're busy tonight, but you can make an appointment with them tomorrow, and they can tell you all about it. But, no, you're, you're, you're telling me this in a way that I understand. Like, that's part of my problem is, is I've listened to this teaching. I don't get a lot of it. It's over my head. Yeah, yeah. And I said, you know, Jay, I, I can't help you, man. I'm sorry. And he's, why won't you help me? And I just he, he just kept following me around, and finally I said, "Dude, like either I'm going to punch you in the face or I'm going to give in." No, I'm just That's right. so I said, uh, "No, I said, man, like, what do you want?" He said, "Well, can I take you to Mellow Mushroom or something, pizza place, and and take you to dinner?" I said, "Yeah, sure. If you'll just leave me alone, like, I got to go out here and you know rain down three pointers, and then I'll be, <laughs> and then I'll go with you to dinner, right?" And yeah, so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Which is not what happened. I, I could have built a house with the bricks I laid Nothing that night. Rim. That's right. <laughs> I actually switched as I walked out the door. I said, you know, it was a mic drop of my own making. But so we go to eat pizza that night. And, I, you know, I go home Sunday and I tell Angel, like, this guy wants me to, to share with him. And I think I'm going to have to tell him my story. And she's like, yeah, don't do that. Like, I don't, mm. that's not just you. This is me too. And right. I'm thinking, well, what am I going to do? So I go home after Mass that day, and I'm like, what a moron. What do I know about the Holy Spirit? And I start just opening Father Larry's book, and I start opening the Bible. And next thing you know, I got like six pages of legal pad pages of stuff on the Holy Spirit from the breath over the water in, in Genesis, you know, the Ruah, all the way through um, uh, Pentecost and beyond. And I'm like, I don't know that I'm the one that should be doing this, but I'm going to go. You know, I told him I would. So I show up, and he shows up, and I've got, like, books and legal pads everywhere. And it looked like a lawyer. I'm like, let's go. You know, you're going to be Holy Spirited, you know, for hours. Yeah. And so he sits down. We order beers. And I remember the waiter walking by. I go, like, what the heck is going on over here? Because I'm sitting there, like, proclaiming the good news at the table and ordering beers at the same time. It's weird. And so uh, – and I'm in Memphis, which is predominantly Protestant, so it probably just threw the yeah, guy for yeah. a loop. Yeah. But – but um, I just start sharing with him, and I tell him all that. And at the end of it, he goes, "Man, this is incredible! You should start a men's group." And I said, "Dude, no, I can't. Like, I just I told you I'd do this tonight. We're done. Like, you know, there's a couple books you can read, and it'll help you." And he said, "Man, no, dude, like, you need to start a men's group. Like, you explain this in a way that, like, again, was very relatable." And and he just kept on and kept on and kept on. And I said, "Jay, I can't do this." And he said, "Why? Why do you always tell me no?" And I just felt convicted by the Holy Spirit, and I just looked at him. I was in jail. I was arrested on a felony charge of cocaine. Like a year ago, I almost lost my family, my job, everything in my life, and I'm not the right person. To, I'm not the right guy. Find somebody else, man. And I expected him to be like, okay, check. Right? Like I didn't realize who I was eating lunch with mm-hmm. or dinner with. And But he sat there, and he said to me again, he looked me dead in the face. He goes, wow, that's amazing. You should start a men's group. And I was like, you got a lot of issues, man. Like you, <laughs> You know, and, and, and he convinced yeah. me. So about a week later, he said, I know people, you know people, you call the guys you know, I'll call the guys I know. No one in my life knew what had happened to me, other than my wife, my immediate family, mm. and my job. So mm-hmm. no one but Jay now. And we called a bunch of men that were in a fundraising group we had at our parish that did great things. They built baseball dugouts, sure, and sure. You, know, you bring cooler beer, we'll do whatever you want. Yeah, And so... But we never talked about God, like ever, yeah. unless the priest was there to bless the food, which wasn't very often. And we called them together into a room, didn't tell them while they were there. Hmm. Jay convinced me to do this. And I didn't know at the time <laughs> that Jay was perpetually late everywhere that he went. But I show up to this room, and it's uh-huh. the time of year where it's dark outside, you know, early. And all these men are in there. You can tell they're kind of clamoring around, like, why are we here? Who? Where are they? All that. So I'm yeah. going, great. They're already worked up. And I go to open the door. And as soon as my hand hits the door... The devil comes back again. He's like, what are you doing? You, what are you, an idiot? You're going to lose everything, right? You on that door and you do what you're about to do. All your friends are going to leave you. They're going to see for who you, you know, see you for who you are. They're going to kick your kids out of the school. They're going to kick your kids out of the parish. Think about what's going to do to your wife. Think about how embarrassed she's going to be to be the wife of a cokehead. Right, all that. Just and I let go of the door just like somebody had been standing beside me, whispering, you know, yelling it in my ear. And so I start walking back to the car, and I get about three steps. And it's like the Old Testament, right? Like God's in the whisper. He's not in the earthquake and the storm. I got about three steps, and I heard, John, when you told me, when you left that prison cell, you told me you were going to be different. You told me you were going to give your, you give, you know, basically give me your life. I want you to open that door. Hmm. And so I turn around, I go open the door, and I walk in there, and these guys are like, what the hell are we doing here? Why are we here? And, oh, you know, wow. where's the beer? And I'm like, I don't know, where's Jay? Like, what a jerk. <laughs> you know, and he comes sloshing in with the cooler and hands out beers, and they calm down, and I just stood up and said, look, you know, 
we have this great men's group. We do a lot of good stuff for the kids, but we never talk about Jesus. And let me tell you what can happen in your life when you never talk about God, when God's not the center of your life. And I went, blah. Really? And I told him everything that I just told you here for however long we've been talking. Yeah. And I was crying, man. I was like snotting everywhere. It was gross. Like, I mean, full on just scared to death, yeah. talking in front of a bunch of men. Their eyes were getting bigger and bigger and bigger as we went along. Oh, I kept waiting you. for them to get up and leave. And I finally just got to the end of it, and I said, that's my story. I think we need to, to meet as men. I don't know what I'm doing, but I think we need something to where we have Jesus at the center of our life. And if you want to stick around, stick around. If you don't, I realize you didn't know why you were here. No hard feelings if you want to leave. And I just you know, planted myself in a chair and put my head down and continued to cry. And the guy stands up next to me, and it's Jay, the guy I've been talking about. And I'm like, you son of a guy, hopefully you're not the one leaving. <laughs> like, if you leave, I'm going to be so mad right now. <laughs> And I look up, and he's crying, and he just says, you know, I'm a terrible father and a terrible husband because I, I spend more of my time worrying about money and work than I do my family. And he sits wow. down sobbing. Wow. The next guy gets up, and he says, I'm so stuck in porn, my wife's about to leave me. The next wow. guy gets up, I smoke pot, and my wife's about to leave me if I don't. One guy got up and said, I'm drunk right now. I Ubered here. <laughs> I have nine kids. We, me and my wife fight uh, all the time. She likes to fight. I like to escape. I've been in a hotel room. I've had a case of beer. She listen. thinks I'm at work. Work thinks I'm at home. Listen. Sick. And he said, I thought we were coming to drink more beer. That's really what he said. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm sorry to disappoint you. But never, <laughs> this is you know, the wrong but, place for that. Right. And so it was like pistons in an engine. All these men just got up all the way around the room. And that's when I realized, Matt, like, we all walk around the world thinking like we're the only alcoholic or the only person struggling with porn or we're the only person with a drug problem or an anger problem or whatever your sin yeah. is, but we're not. And yeah. God showed me that one man, whether it was me or somebody else, standing up and saying the hell with this definition of vulnerability the world has where you're weak and you're less masculine and all that stuff, the hell with that. There's another definition that's God's. And he tells St. Paul, you know, and St. Paul's complaining about the thorn in his side, right? And he says, remove this three times. And God says, no, my power is made perfect in weakness. And then St. Paul goes to learn and, and later on says, if I'm to boast, let it only be my hardships, my difficulties, you know, my my, my burdens. Because, because when I'm weak, I'm strong. And it's like in that moment, I realize we become vulnerable. We, we become humble. We realize we need God. And when we can share that with others in that way, it opens your life and you're no longer in this cell. You know, like I, I tell people that all the time is you may not even realize it, but you're in a virtual prison cell of your made up of walls of your own sins and failures and mistakes and your own thoughts about yourself and the miss, you know, the identity that you've mistaken for yourself. And, and, you know, I, I am this because I did that, mm. that we all do in our life. And every time you go to reach for that door, like I did in the room that night, the devil shows up and he starts poking and prodding those wounds, right? Well, you open that, they're going to figure out about your porn problem. They're going to figure out about your drinking problem. They're going to know you're not the guy you say you are. And so you are a woman and you let go of the door and you stay in that place yeah. because he convinces you that all the pain and the torture and all that stuff's outside. If I go out there, I'm going to lose everything. Yeah. And so we sit in this cell and we torture ourselves all our lives. But when we become vulnerable like that with God, obviously with yourself, I've got an issue. I don't care what sin it is. You know, you don't have to have a crazy, you know, cocaine story. I don't re recommend getting one. If you, you know, just stick with what you got. But, <laughs> but in that moment, like when you become vulnerable. You open that self up. You, you, you say, I have an issue. I'm going to deal with it. You take it to God in the confessional. And then luckily the way I did, you find other people in your life you can trust. And you find you're not the only one. And so you get the courage to open that door. And when the devil comes back and he goes to start poking and prodding, mm. you go, yeah, it doesn't hurt anymore. Right? I'm, I, I've come to grips with that. Mm. Yes, I was a cokehead, but I'm a beloved son of God. Right? I'm not that anymore. And you have no power over me in that way. And, well, what about your porn problem? Yeah, I've told my wife, and I've dealt with God on that, and and, I've, and my brothers hold me accountable. You have no power me over that. Mm. All of it, right? I've, you take that power away from the devil. Now, he's always going to torment you all your life. He hates you, you know. But, but now you can say, like, I have done those things, but I know who I am, and I'm not those things, right? I'm a beloved son of God who is worthy because God says I'm worthy, not because I do or anybody else. And when you can live your life that way, you find that peace and the freedom that Jesus talks about all the time. Right, that peace I wish to give you, mm. because you now realize you live for Him. He's everything in your life. He's the reason for everything in your life, and you start to look at everything as a blessing. And you're not carrying around the weight everybody carries around. Like we spend our life 
white knuckling the steering wheel of our life, trying to control everything. Like I'll give God this and this and that, but not this, not my money, not this. And we're trying to control everything and act like we're fine all the time. Right. I hate that picture. I was talking to you about this last night, that picture at Christmas with like all the people in the elf outfits and they're all <laughs> smiling. And you can tell the dad's like, I hate this so much. <laughs> like They're all in these Christmas clothes and they're going, all right, just yelling, screaming at each other. And it's like, smile. And, and you have the, the picture. Bit you see, yeah. Right. And that's that it on Facebook. Second, yeah. We're perfect. Everything in our life's perfect. It's such crap. We're all broken. And we know we're all broken. So why spend the energy trying to act like you're not? Just come to grips with what's going on in your life and find people that, that love you, you know? And that's what we try to do, you know? We, we try to start men's groups around the country and parishes mm-hmm. and stuff. But that's what I come to find out, Matt, through all of that story, is that I became vulnerable. God loves me no matter what I've done. He doesn't turn away from me. The devil tries to convince you that, you know, he's got his back turns towards you and all those things. And, you know, he, but it's like the prodigal son. He's standing there down the road waiting for you and waiting on you. Sorry, man. I keep going. I, this just struck me. I was yeah, just sure. thinking of that verse in John, but because I'm a good Catholic, I can't quote it verbatim. <laughs> I just thought I was boring. You, no, you, you sort of look for squirrels yeah, or something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this, uh, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, mm. and the darkness comprehended it not. Yeah. Um, the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. I'm looking for that bit that talks about the men didn't want to come into the light because their their deeds were dark, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. I can't remember the verse, though. So apparently I'm not as good of a Baptist <laughs> as I once was. <laughs> yeah, let's just keep going because this this, yeah. this really does speak to it. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. To them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. <laughs> and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Man. Amen. And, you know, you start... It's like that light. It's like you're convinced it's going to kill you. Yeah. It's like we're all in this great banquet hall, and the candles are lit, and the feast is laid, and we're all in the corners. I can't, I can't, I can't go out there because look at me. Yeah. And, And it's like the devil is trying to convince us, yeah, you're right. Stay, stay hid. Don't yeah. go out there. Yeah. Just like you kept saying, you know, like yeah. if I go out there, they will see it. I will be rejected. Right. And it's like it's been said, you know, prior to a sin, when we're tempted to engage in, in something like that, um, the, the Lord says, remember my justice. Yeah. And the devil says, remember God's mercy. But then after you, you've given in and you sin and you're ashamed, God says, remember my mercy. And devil says, remember his justice, you know, he's yeah. trying to condemn us. And yeah, just this idea that the same God that forgave Moses, the murderer, yeah. Rahab, the prostitute, David, the adulterer, Peter, the denier, Paul, the persecutor, yeah. you know, John, the, 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 the Coke addict, Matt yeah. Frad, the porn addict and or whatever else I'm dealing with. It's like, he'll forgive you too. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It is. It, in, in, you know, he wants to keep you out there. He wants you to, and a lot of times because of the you know relationships we have in our life, you know, if you had a domineering parent or a judgmental person in your life like that, mm-hmm. you just sort of project that onto God, that that's who God is. Um, I think about that a lot in the way that I interact with my children is I don't want them to, to like, if I'm very quick to lose my temper and angry and judgmental and punishing, mm-hmm. that that's the way they're going to see God the Father. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and that's the way I think I did a little bit because my dad was sort of like that growing up. And then I think what happens, though, is when you do fail in those areas, yeah. the temptation is then to hate yourself because of yeah. that, which only yeah. compounds the problem. So it's like even in those areas, you have to be gentle with yourself. And, yeah, and, and, you have to and, forgive and, yourself. Yeah. If people worry about forgiveness is like, I've got to forgive this person that offended me, and that's obviously a huge part. Yeah. But you have to learn to forgive yourself too. You know, yeah. I mean, How have you done that? How have I done with, it? With Angela especially and with the kids. <laughs> yeah, well, um, you know, in the very beginning, I beat myself up really badly. You know, like no matter what I was doing, and I'd be happy in a moment with something I'd done, you know, spiritually, I would just go, yeah, but you're never going to be – anything than what you were you know i just hear that and i got to the point where i just had to start believing that god was who he said he was right like that he's not this domineering person 
And so I just, every time that would come, I would do sort of what Jesus did in the, in the desert when the devil would show up and he'd start to tempt him and he'd start to tell him, you know, why don't you throw yourself off of this temple? And he would say, you know, do not put the Lord your God to the test. I'd start meeting him with those things. No, God loves me. That's not Amen. true. Yeah. What you're saying isn't true. And so I quit worrying about who I was and started saying, who can I be through God? Right? Who, can, who does God want me to be? And so I started searching for that. How, how did you deal, because many people have this sort of epiphany moment where they make the decision to be better, and they are becoming better. Sure. But we're not saints yet. Yeah, and sure. so there's, there's, there's minor falls and major falls. Yeah. How do you maintain that enthusiasm to be better as you see your brokenness day in and day out? You know, <laughs> like, I mean, wouldn't it be great if you could just say to Angela, I'm going to be a better man. And then you were a saint and then yeah. you died. But <laughs> that's not that true. Way. You know, it's right. like we, we fail, we get angry, we, we might yell, we, we might look at porn, we, we go back and like a dog to its vomit. How, how, yeah. how have you personally sort of maintained that peace as no doubt as a human being sure. you, you may have had these setbacks? Well, one, I start to understand, I start to understand that I don't need to condemn myself you know that that's one of the worst parts is is to start saying you're not you know oh there you go you picked up your phone again to look at Facebook but that ain't what you looked at mm -hmm. and you looked at something you shouldn't have and, yeah and so instead of just the way I started talking to myself nicer I guess you would say like I quit hating myself and those things and saying you look at you you're no good you make all this progress and you backslide yeah. and that's all you're gonna and I just started saying you know what you messed up right? you messed up and I'm sure God's disappointed I'm disappointed in myself, but he gave us the confessional, right? Like God wants a personal relationship with us. Mm. Like in the sacraments show us that. Like think about that. He put someone in a box, in a confessional, in a room so that someone could physically tell you that he forgave you. Think how powerful that is. Like he loves you so much. He wants no doubt in your mind that he forgives you. Is he disappointed? Yeah, I'm disappointed when Jacob acts out. I'm sure my wife's disappointed when I'm a jerk, but we love each other, and there's forgiveness there, right? And so we have to understand God gave us this gift. It doesn't mean go do whatever you want and then go say you're sorry. There has to be a repentant heart, right? It's what Jesus said first in the Bible. Repent and believe in the gospel. Mm. So what I started to do was not beat up on myself so hard about the fact that I fell, and I started saying, how am I going to keep from doing this again? Mm. Like, And when I went to confession, it wasn't just to grab some cheap shot of mercy and walk out and feel better about myself. Mm. It was, Lord, I, I fully repent. I turn, right? That's what repent means, to turn right. away from. I fully repent in this moment, and I'm trying to do everything I can to not do this again. And so I started just trying to do that, and then I started thinking, man, if I don't want to live a life of vice, then I need to start looking at living a life of virtue. And how do you do that? And so I just started doing things in my life, like setting up prayer time, you know, making God the focus of my life and not the last thing I do every day. So first thing in the morning, hit my knees and pray, Lord, thank you for waking me up. Thank you for allowing me to breathe. Thank you for these beautiful children and this beautiful wife that I get to spend my life with again because you're merciful. Right and help me to be the man that you call me to be. You've given me gifts. Help me to understand what they are, so I can glorify your name now and for the rest of my life. You know, and I do those things, and then I spend time in the Word, and I go to Mass. You know, daily Mass is is the greatest gift. You know, because the Eucharist is there, and you can you can take it in, and that's one of the greatest forms of strength in my life is that God makes Himself small so that he can give me the strength to do the things that he asked me to do. Again, he wants a personal relationship with you. He says here is my very body, because I've asked you to do things that I know are hard, and there's everything in the world that's trying to pull you to do everything else and to be bad, and that's easy, and to fall to these things. I know they're the, the enemy's there trying to lay a snare at your feet every time, but I'm giving you this. right? I've given you the Holy Spirit, but now I'm giving you my very body so that you have the strength to do what I've asked you to do each and every day. And that's why I go to Mass every day I can, and that's been mm -hmm. one of the stalwarts in my life is, is when I don't go to Mass, I usually have a bad week. Mm -hmm. And it's because I'm starting to fall back into what John wants, how John wants it, all that stuff, instead of combating it with the most selfless person ever that ever lived in Jesus Christ, taking I, I love my body that. each every day. You said after prison you went back to your house and – you were kind of saying, here I am, king of the house, you know? Yeah. And then you were saying, you can't congratulate yourself on no longer doing evil. You have to put good there. It's like yeah. that nature abhors a vacuum sort of thing. Yeah, sure. I, I love that. It's not just about not being vicious. It's about how do I actively pursue God? Yeah. Right. That's what it is. And then just putting other people first in your life. You know, your mutual friend of ours, Bill Donahue. What a guy. He, yeah, he's amazing. And I worked with him at Rise, you know, like I did with you. I mean, not Rise, but Cardinal. And... um 
you know, I fell in love with the theology of the body because of him and the just the gift he has at teaching it. And I asked him one day, I was like, you know, I don't really want to read that 738 page book. And like, I don't know that I would understand it all. Like, can you give me the abridged version? You know, and he's like, be a gift. Mm. Just be a gift. And, and that's what I try to tell myself each and every day is like everything that I have a motive to do. Wow. Am I doing this for like me or am I doing it for somebody else? I mean, that's why I do these men's groups. That's why I'm involved in one at home outside all the speaking and the other stuff we do in the ministry is because I need it too. Right, like those guys will come to me, and I'm sure you get some of this because of the stuff you do. They'll be like, "John, you've you know, helped me in my life. You've changed this," and I just I get teary out every time. I'm like, "You have no idea what you've done for me." Mm. Right, like I am able to be the person that I am because of you. Mm. Because you show up here, you want to walk this path too, and you give me some people that make me you give me the idea that this can be accomplished because there's people walking shoulder to shoulder with me doing it. Right, and it's just so important in our life to have that. And so often, especially in these days, we want to isolate. You know, social media and all these things just kind of put you on your own planet, your own realm. Mm-hmm. And that's the other thing I do is I surround myself with good people that want to go to heaven, right? That want to be good fathers. That you know, guys that that want to put their phone down and go outside and throw the ball with their kid. You know, and still want to have a good time, have a beer and a cigar yeah, yeah. and all that stuff, and realize there's. There's, you know, you're not one extreme or the other, right? You're not super evil or super good. There's just being human and that we have to work at being what God calls us to be. I mean, He never said, Hey, I'm going to come down here and down on a cross and everything's going to be easy for you, right? So we a cakewalk. <laughs> I'm taking all this on. Yes, it hurts, all this stuff. No, He looks at you and He says, Look, people, I hate you because they hated me, right? You'll be persecuted because they persecuted me. He's not promising you. And he's going like, to pick up your cross and follow me, right? There's, we all have whatever it is in our life. It's not an excuse to not deal with it. It's to pick it up and to figure out how to deal with it in our life. We need God. We need other people. We need the sacraments. We need the full gifts of everything the Catholic Church gives us to be the man that God calls us to be. But, Matt, that's the thing. So many people, I had a guy I was telling you the other day, you know, I spoke in Indiana, and, and I gave my conversion story, and he stood up at the end, and he said, well, I don't have some crazy heroin story. And I said, well, you should get one, you know. <laughs> I, just, I was trying to break the ice, you know, because he yeah. seemed a little angry for some reason. And... <laughs> He just said, he looked at me and he said, I'm 31 years old. I'm an accountant. You know, I I go to work every day and I I don't really like my job. I take my kids to school, go to work, come home, you know, kiss the wife, you know, look around at what's to be done, pour myself into Netflix or a couple of stiff drinks, and I get up again and I do it the next day. Is there not more to life than this, right? I mean, it's just the mundaneness of life when you don't have a purpose, right? And so... You know, this is the thing, like as men especially, we're told like, all right, you got to check all these boxes, like go go to high school, check, excel at sports, check, go to college, check, you know, meet a girl, check, have 2.5 children, and if you're Catholic, have 9.7, you know, and all of these things. And then you get to the point in your life where it's like, all right, I'm in my 30s, and what, what where's the next box? Yeah. Right? What's the next thing in my life? And and so... Midlife crisis, right, check. That's right. <laughs> Do a bunch of coke. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so there was... <laughs> But you come to realize, like, the reason that life feels that way is because we don't have Christ at the center of it, right? That he's the one who tells us who we are. And for so yeah. often in our life, we try to white-knuckle it and force our way because that's kind of how we were raised as men is you figure it out, tough it out, don't have emotions, the things I was talking about earlier. But the thing is, like, we all have gifts, right? And that's what I, come to, that's what I came to figure out. I was a good salesman because of the gifts that God gave me relational things i care i had empathy i cared about people uh, you know i put them first that's why i was successful because if they were successful i'd be successful um not in a selfish way but if i took care of them then i figured you know i'd be taken care of in the process and you know it showed me that that those gifts were meant for something else and i got to the point in my life where i was just like i wanted christ the center of it so i walked away from that job and you know was offered a job by cardinal and that lasted a little while and then Started the podcast and, yeah. and did the, the the nonprofit. My wife comes to me again. The same in my life. I lose my job three days before Christmas because they were going a different direction and couldn't use a mm. salesman at Cardinal and and um, and I'm sitting there like in tears because I'm like, what have I done? I left my job and all this stuff, and now I'm gonna have to go tell my wife. We had three kids home, all of them with the flu that day, and I'm like, she's not gonna want to hear this. <laughs> and so <laughs> she comes walking through the room, you know, and I've got a tear in my eye, and, and she's like, what happened? You know, is something wrong with your dad or? 
And I looked at her and I just said, I lost my job. And she hit her knees and she goes, well, you know what? Maybe God's calling you to start that nonprofit. I love be- your wife. Yeah, she's I did terrific. Too. <laughs> I've never met her. I can't wait yeah. to meet her. Oh, yeah. I can't wait to bring you to bring oh, you guys together. She's man. amazing. But in that moment, like I was like, how am I going to do this? And I started to examine my gifts and I went into scripture again. And I started to look at what St. Paul says. And I think I believe it's in wisdom too, where they start you know, uh, naming all the different gifts. And I'm going, well, what do I have? You know, do I have a gift of prophecy, of wisdom? Doesn't seem like I have a lot of wisdom. <laughs> Maybe a little bit of knowledge. Like, what are these different ones? And then I started to look and go, okay, I have gifts. I have an overall singular purpose that we all have, which is to bring people to Christ, right? Go and make disciples and baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But within that purpose, we all have a unique purpose. You found yours. You're doing this, and it's changing the lives of people all over the world. I found this, and I'm doing it and helping men. Tell, tell people about it. Just a yeah. guy in the pew. Again, there's a link at the top of the description below to all those who are checking out who can who can uh, find your podcast. Yeah. But one of the things I was really uh, impressed to see is that you have these these monthly prayer journals, yeah. masculine prayer journals That's right. that, that you send out. That, that, and you showed it to me before, and it looked really great. Tell us about yeah. that. Yeah. So it's the Narrow Roads, what it's called. And, and you know, Ryan Foley helped me put that together, a mutual friend. Um, you know, we I was sitting there looking at the ministry. The podcast had started, and all we were doing was really talking about the sins we struggle with in our life. I had no idea how to do a podcast. There was a deacon that was on EWTN, Deacon Jeff Drzemski, lives in my town. He said, I love the stuff you're doing with men. You know, you come up, you show up, I'll hit record, and you start talking. I had mm. no clue what I was doing. But we had a bag of what I called the bag of sins. So in the beginning, guys were some guys were embarrassed and wouldn't talk about things in their life. So I had them, um, I took a bunch of pieces of paper and ripped them up. And one night when everybody came in, I said, write down what you're struggling with in a couple words. Don't write a dissertation, just, you know, porn, you know, whatever it is. And we'd pick those out and talk about them. And guys would feel, uh, you know, They'd have the ability to speak about them because it wasn't me standing up going, I struggle with porn and all that, so mm-hmm. they could speak freely about it. So when he asked me, I said, he goes, well, what would you talk about? I said, you know, I got this bag <laughs> of sins. I mean, a lot of guys are, ta- are struggling with this stuff. I'd pull them out, and there's like 18 of them that struggle with confession or something like that. Yeah. So we started doing those shows. And through that, the ministry started growing. I started getting asked to speak. And uh, we had the men's group that started at my parish that night, still meeting every Wednesday for six years since then. Praise God. Um, being there for each other. Yeah. Well, there were guys in there that would show up, and we kind of dump our dirty laundry. Like, I mean, I suck this week, and here's why. Yeah. You know, and, and eventually got to the point where, okay, we can't just talk about how bad we, you know, terrible we are. Like, that's not good <laughs> for anybody either. As fun as this either. is, yeah. Yeah, like, <laughs> it's my turn to, you know, hit myself in the head with a hammer, you know. And, but we had to move on. And yeah. so I thought, okay, discipleship is a big part of what Jesus talked about. So how do we become become the men that we need to be. So I had the things that you asked me about I was doing in my life that kept me moving in the direction that I hoped was towards heaven. And some of the guys in the group would call me during the week and they'd say, man, I know it was there Wednesday night and it was great that night, but man, my life sucks. My wife's mad at me. My daughter's you know, angry. I might get fired, you know, and, I, and I'd listen to it for like an hour or whatever during the day. And this is, I was still working at, at the auto parts place at the time. And this one guy in particular, he knows who I'm talking about. I told him this. Um, he calls me every Monday, and I finally get to the point where I'm like, "Dude, wait! Before you start this diatribe, <laughs> like you know, have you have you, been, have you been to mass? No. Have you prayed? No. Have you like gone to confession or adoration or anything?" And he's like, "No." And I said, "Call me back when you've done any one of those things." Yeah. And so they get mad and hang up the phone, and cuss me out. <laughs> You're jerk you're supposed to help me. Some Jesus guy you are. You know, and, and uh, so yeah. anyway, I, you know, I, I, they'd call me back like the next day and they'd say, dude, I, as mad as I was at the time, I went by the church, I sat for the tabernacle and things are better. And I was like, yeah, isn't that funny how when we do the things we know we need to do, our life gets better. Yeah. So that narrow road was basically putting together an opportunities for grace chart with like, hey, you want more of God in your life? This isn't commitment because guys hate it. the word commitment, yeah. right? Yeah, it's just like, hey, Matt, you want to come to this in two weeks? Ask me the day before. You know, it's just none of us want to do that. But you had all these things like morning prayer, daily mass, confession, adoration, time with my wife, time with my kids, and guys can check what they're doing every I love day. That. It's so beautifully laid out too. How do people yeah. get it? They... they get it at just a guy on the pew.com. So they okay. can sign up there. There's something at the top that says join our community. Cool. When they do, they sign up, they get the book. It's I think twenty five a month to come to their door, beginning of the month, and then it's got reflections, every five reflections. You work through a virtue, a different one every month. Perseverance, patience, gratitude, generosity, humility, whatever it is and you work through it in the four main relationships of your life. Guys say all the time, I want to be virtuous. And they're like, 
when's it going to happen? Where's the virtuous bolt coming from? <laughs> and it never happens like that. So we have to actively yeah. seek it. So each week you live it in those relationships. And so it's making you like, how did I live perseverance in my relationship with my wife today? So you have all that. There's prayers in there that help you with the virtue. You sign up for it. It comes to your door at the beginning of the month. We have parish options where guys and groups can get into it. We have videos we make that go along with it. They're eight to 10 minutes that kick them off in a meeting. And there's hundreds of guys doing it. I got a picture of a guy in Scotland the other day holding wow. it up, and there was a narrow path he was standing on in his grass. He's like, I'm on the narrow road with my narrow road. I'm like, all right, oh, that's, that's cool. That's so cool. So that's what we've been doing, and that's all I want to do, Matt. I didn't get into this to to be on a stage or anything. I just want to help people find what I've found, that we have a merciful God who loves you and can do amazing things with your life if you let him. What I want to do is uh, is just take a break for two minutes, and when okay. we get back, I want to ask you about your 30 days of rehab and what that mm-hmm. was like, and then we'll take some questions from the live chat and from our patrons. So if you're here, please stick around. We'll be back in two minutes. All right. All right, I want to say thank you to Ethos Logos Investments for supporting this show, elinvestments.net slash pints. I guess when I was a bit younger, I thought that investing was something that only rich people did or old people did or rich old people did. I didn't realize it was something that I should be looking into as well. And when I began looking into it, I realized I don't want to invest in companies that are doing immoral things. And that's where Ethos Logos Investments comes in. They were founded to work with individuals and institutions within the United States that seek to infuse their morals into their investment portfolio, with portfolios that adhere to the US Conference of Catholic Bishops Responsible Investing Guidelines. You can be sure that you aren't profiting from intrinsic evils like abortion, embryonic stem cell research, pornography, or human trafficking. Please go check them out. Ethos Logos Investments is what they're called, elinvestments.net slash pints. There's a link in the description below. elinvestments.net slash pints. For employers, they offer socially responsible and Catholic 401k and 403b options as well. So yeah, go check them out, elinvestments.net slash pints. Securities offered through Securities America Inc., member FINRA SIPC. Ethos Logos Investments and Securities America are separate entities. Advisory services offered through Securities America Advisors Incorporated. Yes. The second group I want to thank is Hallo. Hallo, H-A-L-L-O-W dot com slash Matt Frad. Hallo dot com slash Matt Frad. Hallo is a fantastic app that will help you to pray and meditate. It's not like new age mindfulness apps that lead into wrong ways of thinking. This is 100% Catholic and it's super sophisticated. If you go to hallow.com slash Matt Frad and sign up there, you'll get a few months for free before deciding if you want to pay a minimal amount every month to have access to their entire app. Now, you can download the app right now and you'll get access to certain things for free. So be sure to check that out if you just want to you know, play around with it and see what they have to offer. But if you want access to everything that they have, like sleep stories and Bible studies and all sorts of beautiful things like that, you, you, you have to pay a certain amount every month to get access to that. If you want access to everything for a few months, just go to hallow.com slash Matt Frad. Hallow.com slash Matt Frad and sign up there. Thanks. <laughs> I didn't realize that was you the whole time. I thought you had somebody playing that. <laughs> no, that's me singing for two minutes. <laughs> and I thought you were just <laughs> gifted <laughs> at, at pints. <laughs> Man, this is amazing. We have like 400 people chilling. Um, Amazing. So before we get to questions, and Neil, maybe you can keep track if we get any super chats or something, but I wanted to ask you about the 30 days of... Yeah, yeah, recovery. What was that like? Because you never got into that. It was crazy, man. Honestly, I've never been, you know, I was embarrassed, obviously. Um, and it was, it, was, it was weird because it, there was a lot of young people. Like, I was sitting there thinking I was terrible for, like, the coke I was doing. But there was a lot of kids that, like, were in there their fourth time and they were 19 and they were heroin addicts. And I didn't realize at that time in my life, like, heroin such a big deal. There was these – and, and the, the young people would come in and, like, it, I would be in the group session with the counselor – and they knew each other like on a first name basis because the kids just kept coming back in there, you know. And so it was very hard 
because I was trying to seriously, like, I want to change my life. You know, I want this to, I want to, I had my notebook and I was doing all the things they asked me to do and reading the books they suggested, which yeah. some of them were not very Catholic. You know, they were very kind sure. of Eastern spirituality stuff. But, um, you know, I tried yoga and it just hurt a lot. I'm big and it, I'm not flexible. But, <laughs> but no, we would sit there and, and it was hard because, Angel and I weren't in a good place. I was going in and out of there. I didn't feel like there was anybody I could relate to because they were really either they were either alcoholics, yeah. which I mean I'm drinking a beer right now to explain that to people. Like <laughs> Coke was my problem, <laughs> you know. I drank beer to offset the Coke. I'm not, you know, I don't have yeah. a problem with drinking, but um, it just was hard to to identify with anybody. So I'd read these books and I looked at one the other day and I was like, man, I'm glad I did not go down that path because it was really contrary to what the church believes and things like oh, that. Right. <clears throat> so that was hard, but I just, I took it seriously. Uh, I went every day. I fought the shame that came from, you know, I'm in a rehab place and all that. Just thought, no, I'm fixing my life. Yeah. Um, I did go to AA. People ask me that a lot. I didn't care for it that much. Mm -hmm. um, I went to NA and I really didn't like that. I felt more comfortable at AA. But what, why is that? I don't know. Like it just, it was a different feel. It may have just been the meeting, you know, like because yeah, they had yeah. different people leading the meetings. Right. But, but I went to AA and and you know it became sort of like a crutch for me a little bit. Like mm -hmm. I would go just to get out of the house and have somebody to talk to because Angel and I obviously weren't really in a great place at that yeah. time. And I noticed there was a lot of men. Like, there was these two old men, and they'd sit there every day, and they'd be like, I went to a park bench today, and I looked at the sky, and the kids walk in, and I didn't have a beer today. You know, and I was just like, I'm so glad they found a place like this, but, like, I want my life to be joyful, you know? Like, and, and right now, and I'm not knocking AA, please don't anybody think I'm doing that. Sure. But I just, I wasn't finding it there. I've really found it in the church. Mm. But it was it was hard, you know? I mean, going every day constantly admitting yourself you had a problem the hardest part was getting angel to go to al-anon like you know mm. to go to those meetings on saturday she was because she would just i guess it made it real for her you know like i'm in this place with all these people yeah, that have problems like a, and, it's like admitting it isn't right. it and i'm here because of you yeah, you know yeah. and so saturday mornings were never that pleasant after that meeting you know obviously <laughs> but she stuck through it she kept her book how did, and how did you deal with the retching you know earlier you were saying your body would physically retch yeah. wanting the cocaine it, it how did that well, it just, it was hard. I just had to get used to it. You know, I just had to deal with it. And there was a lot of times where I just would try to work out or something to like offset just to do something other than sitting there feeling sick. Um, you know, I would, I would oftentimes when it came on, I would go to the church to pray and just offer it up. Like the Lord, this is, you know, this is for all others that are suffering and haven't found you. That kind of Cause, stuff. I mean, you said you had made a thousand promises and, and went back. Yeah. Was there a time or that you were like, crap, I'm going back again. This is crazy. Um, yeah. After that really conversion moment, after being in jail, was there a point where you thought you might go back to it? No, and people ask me a lot too. They're like, how do you go from doing that much cocaine to does it ever bother you? And I mean, yeah, if I hear Eric Clapton's cocaine come on the radio, there might be a hair on the back of my neck stand up or, mm. you know, a movie like Blow or something comes on, I'm changing the channel and I see it. And mm. But this is going to sound like a corny answer. But when I'm in the car and that song comes on, I look in the rearview mirror at my three beautiful kids, and I look at my wife and the place that I have, that God's grace is the only reason I'm here, and I wouldn't throw that away for anything. Yeah. There are real relationships I have in my life, like real friendships. Mm. The people that love me, that I love, I mean, guys like you and other people that I that I really just – I stop, and, and every time that comes around, I start to count my blessings. And I start to go, yeah, when you were doing that, you were lonely, you were addicted to porn, you felt like crap all the time. You had two. I had two surgeries on on a deviated septum because of the damage I did to my nose. Really? Wow. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah, I don't want that anymore. Here, I have a wife who loves me. We're equally yoked. I have children that love to be around me, and I love to be around them. And I have the greatest friends I've ever had in my life, mm. and I have a purpose. So when the devil comes and he starts pulling on that thread, I just cut it off, and I look at the, the gifts that God's given me and say, I'll never give this up. I'll never give this up. Want to? Just looking in the live chat right sure. now. You're not boring me. I'm just okay. kind of got one eye on the questions coming in. Well, I don't care if I'm boring you. <laughs> I have a microphone. And I'm just <laughs> JW just says, does confessing to your brother matter? I found that telling people about your sins, especially your loved ones, 
you need forgiveness from was essential to restoration you so that was his experience yeah oh yeah for sure like you you have to i mean and that's you find that in any sort of aa or any sort of 12-step deal is you have to you know make amends with the people that you've hurt doesn't mean that they have to accept it that is an often time mistake where we get really upset because someone won't take our forgiveness that we're so freely giving yeah but it's not about that it's about you know, going and doing what you're asked to do is asking forgiveness. You can't control whether they forgive you or not. Mm. But what you can do is go and and be, you know, be repentant and to be sorry for what you've caused. Uh, that's what I found with Angela. As many times I said I'm sorry, it didn't matter because she wasn't in a place to forgive me. Mm. And that the devil would use that, right? Like, see, no matter what you're going to do, she's never going to forgive you. Your marriage is always going to be terrible. You're always. And I had to understand, like, I can't command her. I can't make her forgive me. Right. But what I can do is go with an open and honest heart and ask for forgiveness with my whole heart. Mm-hmm. And eventually, you know, you change your behavior. You change the way you are. And you have people in your life that are accepting and loving like like Angela was. Then those things sort of fix themselves. But yeah, did you ever go back to some of those guys you were doing coke with and and reach out to them? And yeah, I mean, it was it was kind of after you know the the jail bell got rung, a lot of them just kind of disappeared <laughs> disappeared from me. You know, I see them at football games and we go to the University of Memphis games and mm. stuff like that. But I think it was a wake up call for a lot of them. You know, and they just kind of said like, "Glad it wasn't me." But you know, I moved on in my life. Everything that in that time of my life, I look back and like I don't really have memories of college. A lot of people are like, "Oh, college was the greatest ever." I'm like, mm-hmm. I, it was one of the worst times of my life. So, I kind of move away from that. I, I see them. I'm cordial to them. Some of them go to the, you know my parish, and 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 it's not like I don't like them. It's just I kind of separate myself from anything that was in that life. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Chekub. Makolo says, John, have you ever considered adding the rosary to your spiritual practice? Uh, yes. And then did you? Any further? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, yes, I have. And somebody asked this the other night. It's something I was doing. And I don't do the rosary as much as I should. Um, I should do it every day, I know. And Mary said, too. Um, I have other forms of prayer that I, fi- I feel closer to, to Jesus in, really. And I'm yeah. not... Not saying there's anything wrong with Rosie. I hope to grow in that relationship more with her. Is this why you gave me a Rosie? I did because I didn't need it. it. I don't use it, so I gave it to you. I said he'll use it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see here. Do you ever, uh, Elliot Brubaker? Thanks for being here, Elliot. He says, "Does your experience shape your opinion on the politics of the war on drugs?" Do you have any strong opinion on that? Well, I mean, obviously, drugs are bad, and we don't need them. Like, I mean, I, I yeah, I think it's the worst thing, one of the worst things in the world. I mean, porn's up there too, but uh, with the way people are treated and all those things. But yeah, I mean, it, just to for this stuff to pour in our country, and all the kids are doing stuff, bath salts, all that kind of crazy stuff. I mean, yes, it's that stuff needs to be taken care of, and our, our country needs to be clean of it. I don't know that it ever, ever will be. But I don't know that there's more things out there that tear apart a family quicker mm-hmm. than that. Um, Jay Scoffman says, I'm a husband and a father of three, and I'm awaiting trial. What are some things that can help me get through this? Man. Well, I don't know what your relationship's like with your wife and with your kids right now. Um, you know, maybe you could put that in there. But um, – one, you have to start moving past the things that you've done. I mean, you really need to spend some time with the Lord in prayer, uh, with a priest and some other people that can help you understand what your identity is now. I mean, I think it's one of the biggest problems we have in the world is it's like I said before, we identify with what we've done and the devil keeps us in that place. So you need to start understanding whatever you're facing, whatever you've done, that God isn't sitting there looking at you and accusing you of that. That his back, he's he's like the father and the prodigal son. He sees you coming on that horizon, and he can't wait to embrace you, to give you his coat, to give you his ring, all those things. He doesn't care about the pig slop and the mess that the the prodigal son had on in the in the story. He embraced him anyway, mm. and it's the same thing with you, man. Like that's you, beautiful. I didn't ever make that connection before. It's not like the father said, "Go wash up, and then yeah, I'll give you a good like, hug." Here's the hose, you money scrubbing, you know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> he wasted everything. No, he comes home, and and that's I love that parable because. It shows us humility, vulnerability, and all these things. The son finally is flopping around in that pig slop, and he's eating pot. He won't even eat the pods. They won't give him the pods. They're feeding the pigs. And he's saying, they won't even give me those. And one day, he's sitting there in that mess, and he says, even my father's servants 
are treated better than this. That's mm. the moment of humility, right? Like I've got myself in this mess. I can't get myself out and I need someone else. I need to go home to my father. And so he goes, and then when he gets there, I can't remember all the verses, but he basically starts spewing all his father. I've wasted what you've given me. Yeah. And the father's not sitting there with a raised hand or, or, you know, someone waiting to torture him or to, you know, to do something to him. He's sitting there facing him and he takes his finest robes, right? His finest robes, his finest ring, calls for the finest calf, and he puts it on this pig slop, pig dung covered guy. And he never once says, you know what? You're, you're, you shouldn't have done this. You shouldn't have done that. He receives him and he even tells the brother who's angry about it, you should be rejoicing because our son was lost and he's come home. Mm. Right? I mean, that's, that's my answer to that. Start building a relationship with Jesus. You do that through prayer, through the scripture, through the mass, and through the sacraments because you're going to need it through all the hard times you're going to go through. Uh, thanks to Deborah R. for the super chat. She says, does John's wife ever give her testimony as a spouse? Would love to hear it. Yeah, we've been talking about that. Andrew's uh, Andrew. I don't mean. God, it's the second time I've had like, a, a boyfriend. That's right. Jeez. God, people are gonna be like, "All right, I'm done." We just went to 100 viewers. No, just kidding. Oh, no, man. Angela. We'd love you anyway. Um, she is uh, you and Andrew. She's. She, <laughs> we look good together. No. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> she's, she's an introvert. And so we talked about doing it one time and it was still sort of like yeah, sore. Yeah. So I've actually thought about having Deacon Jeff come on my podcast and like I'm mm-hmm. not on it and yeah. let him interview her. Um, yeah, you know, if you were ever interested in it, she'd love yeah. to talk to you, I'm sure. My wife too would be. Yeah. If yeah. Cameron talked about it one yeah. time. Yeah. But no, I'd love for her too. And she's at the point now where she is. We started that men's group and now she started a. Um, what is it called? Walking with Purpose group. Yeah. And there's 35 women meeting. Man. And yeah. so she's she's really – she was always a better Catholic and better Christian than I ever was, even to this day. But she sort of found herself in all of this. Mm. And uh, we're really equally yoked in a lot of this. And so she's she's willing it's to do lovely. that. I need to figure out how to do it that gives justification to it. And, and not justification, but um, gives her the best opportunity to really share her heart the way I've been able to share mine. Um, we have a, let's see, cyber girl who is also a patron. Thank you very much. She says a wife and mum here. I'm dealing with a hair trigger tempter, temp, uh, temper. Oh, temper. I gotcha. Okay. Um, I've been dealing with a chronic pain condition and I'm exhausted from suffering. Bless you. Bless you. Bless yeah, you. Any program for women. She's saying, I mean, there's plenty. I mean, we just mentioned walking with purpose. Um, I think I wonder if she's talking about a program to overcome oh, anger. But. Oh, anger! Yeah, yeah. Bless Sonia you. Corbett's got something for that. Does she? Yeah, go look up Sonia Corbett. It's called Rest, I believe, and it's all about anger, anxiety. She did like a fifteen-part series, and it's free on her website. Wow. Which I think is BibleStudyEvangelista dot com. Okay. So she's a friend, and she's awesome. She's coming to I've my heard parish. Great things. Weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Neil, let us know if that's right. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Check that out. God bless you. You beautiful woman. I mean. Yeah, you know when you're a kid and you wonder why old people are grumpy, yeah. and you just had no idea how much pain they're in just from being kind of older. Yeah, I mean, you and I are getting older, and sure. like we have back aches and knee aches and things like this. And as you get older, that just can get worse. And if you're in chronic pain, yeah. it is, it's understandable, you know, yeah. that you'd be angry and lashing out, but yeah, it doesn't make anything better. So check out, yeah, that, uh, yeah. I'm sort of an Adonis, so I don't have All those right. problems. <laughs> uh, Cybergirl Neil will put a link in the description below to that and to anybody else who's looking to kind of try to overcome anger. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, here's a funny story before I mispronounce this person's name. Okay. <laughs> I'm really bad at names, and that's probably because I'm from Australia. Yeah. Like, John and whoever, Bruce. Yeah. But I was I was in Canada and I was leading this small group and uh-huh. they kind of give you a list of the kids that were going to be in my small group, you know. Yeah. So I'm reading through it and you know, like John A with me. Um oh, Jack Hughes. <laughs> Jack Hughes. Jacques. Oh Jacques, my bad. All right. So so with that, with Although that in Jacques mind, is Philippe. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Guillermo says Sorry, mate, if I move that up, I messed that up. This is such a moving testimony, he says. Not directly related, but what's one piece of advice you would give to men that are about to enter fatherhood? Um, that's a good question. Man, honestly, come to grips and, and start to realize how selfish you are. 
because that's it's really hard like i you know mm-hmm. i always tell people all the time you want to figure out how selfish you are get married like, and then have the, kids yeah and then have kids and amen so just start to realize like i have this there's a life that i'm going to be responsible for right and it is the greatest gift that the father could give there's so many people that that can't have children and things like that and and that I need to get rid of some of the things in my life, and there's going to be a change, right? I, I kind of thought, well, I'll keep doing what I'm doing. I'll keep going to the bar on Tuesday night and meeting my buddies yeah. and all that stuff. And so I would simply just start to focus on where in my life I feel that I'm putting myself first and start try to remove some of that stuff and get ready because this 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 kid is going to be the greatest gift in your life, you know, other yeah. than your wife, and you need to be able to be prepared to give your whole self to him. Yeah. Yeah, I just just feel like I want to say this to all those who are watching right now. Maybe you're watching this after the fact, and I know this sounds like a shameless plug here, but if, if this if this testimony from John has impacted you, please share it on Facebook. Please like. Please comment. Help the algorithm because I really think that this is a story that's actually going to change people's lives. You know, I just had a, a Pints with Aquinas Patreon conference last uh-huh. last week and just meeting people who because of the interviews I've had like I just became Catholic, you know, I was, uh, sure. I was a you know, Protestant professor or I was doing this stuff and then so it's it is remarkable. It's I mean you sit here in cyberland, you, yeah. you're probably the same, you run a podcast and sure. you, you forget that there's real people On the flesh and blood it, yeah. who are being impacted and I have no doubt that this story is going to impact a lot of people so please share it. Uh, give us a thumbs up, uh, you know, leave a comment, and let's let's try to get this out there. Um, Nate Noble says, should everyone with a powerful conversion share their story? Or is it better to just ponder these things in your heart like Mary? That's a good question. Um, you know, I would say that you have a story and you need to tell it. Not everybody, you know, I never asked to be on a stage or any of that stuff. It's just what's happened with all this. But, you know, and I'll murder this quote. You probably know it. <laughs> but, like, um, I think it was Pope Paul VI said something about, like, they're good teachers, but only when they're first witnesses or yeah, something like that. Uh, pe- pe- yeah, people listen to witnesses more than teachers. And if they are listening to teachers, it's because they're first witnesses. Yeah, that's something it. To that yeah, effect, you had yeah. to show me up, whatever. You're welcome. Just <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so that was it. And I think it's the truth. Like, people ask me all the time, what can I do? I feel like there's nothing I can do. Or, like, the guy says, I don't have some crazy Coke story. No, but you have a story. Mm. And Jesus has touched you individually in some way. And there's going to be somebody that benefits with that. You know, oftentimes people, I hear it all the time, I don't know how to evangelize. I know we're supposed to, but I don't know how to. And you think that you've got to be able to quote Aquinas or to be able to quote the church fathers and say something that's just ridiculously intelligent at any time. But a lot of times what changes lives it's just saying, like, look, I was here and now I'm not. It's one of my favorite lines from The Chosen, right? And I think it's the second episode with Mary Magdalene mm-hmm. and Nicodemus is coming back trying to figure out how she was healed. And he says, you know, was it me? Was it me? And she said, no, it wasn't you. And he finally, she, he says, well, what happened? And she said, there was this man and I was one way. Yes, and all, that's right. Yeah, and, and then he came into my life or something like that, and now I'm another way, and now I'm completely different, and so I will know him for the rest of my life. Every one of us has that story, whether it's porn and, and things you dealt with, Matt, or it's drugs and what I've dealt with, whether it's a, a loss of a parent or something, you have a story that's going to affect somebody. Again, you're not the only person that's gone yeah. through that thing you're, in your you're life. You're not that interesting. Right. Yeah, you're not right. that you're, yeah. you're right. unique in a way that's beautiful, but you're not your sin isn't what makes you special. Right. Yeah. And so you share that and you don't know how that impacts people. I wouldn't be sitting here today if it wasn't for that young focus ministry. Yeah, you know what? I just to, to go up. to sorry, mate. No, you're I, okay. Just cut you off. But to go along with that analogy we talked about earlier about yeah. this banquet and there's light in the middle and we're all off on the peripheries in the darkness, afraid to come out. Sure. It's almost like, you know, you're by the table being like, No, no, come. Yeah. Come. Like let me tell you, I was as gross as you think you are. Yeah. But he loves you. You. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You have this invitation. You're just not. You're not opening it. That's that's the real the real mm, issue. That's a know? good way to put it. Uh, Jordan Oreck says that he is a non-denominational charismatic pastor who is now halfalic, meaning half, like half sure. Catholic, because Bishop Barron started showing up on my YouTube feed. <laughs> so he says sharing links can really help people. So again. Don't think that your little share of this video isn't going to impact people. It very much might. Thank you, yeah, jo- thank Jordan, you. and God bless you on your journey. Yeah. Uh, oh, here he says, uh, the same fellow says, I'm currently attending 
uh, RCIA classes every week as well. I'm not full awesome. blown Catholic at the moment, but down the road we'll see. Yeah, bless you, brother. Wait till they get to the fathers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Ryan says I'm definitely suffering with addiction, addiction to rage, distraction, porn, lust, and gluttony. I know that much of it is due to the internet, but I'm struggling to quit. The internet has led me back to Christ and also keeps me from drawing closer. Ooh, what a beautiful yeah. line. What a beautiful yeah. line. Yeah. That's tough. I mean, it is definitely a double-edged sword. You know, yeah. there's good things and bad things in it. Yeah, I mean, I I mean, one of the ways I've tried to kind of regulate my internet use, and as everybody knows by now, is by getting rid of my smartphone. Mm -hmm. It's not like I'm off the internet. I'm on the internet. Yeah. But when I go home, I don't have any computer I can access there. Yeah. Like we have a desktop, but I just had my wife change that password because I, it's not even because of porn. It's not even because of temptation to porn. It's because... It's because of, oh, I was going to go check that thing. And then three hours later. Yeah. And, and even if it's not three hours later, it's like five minutes out of every hour. Yeah, or it it sure. just takes my time away. So, so you know, I, I see what this person is saying, and um, it does bring you closer, but maybe there's a way you can regulate it like that. Because now when I go home, I, sometimes I'll wonder like, oh, I wonder if that guy emailed me back. I really want to get that email. I, you know, wonder, but, but I can't do anything about sure, it until the yeah. next day. Sure. So it, it's just a way to sort of regulate it because I, I do think smartphones – so-called and, and smart watches god have mercy why you would want yeah, to tether yourself one. to the internet yeah boggles my mind um you know th th these things i think are often smarter quote unquote than us yeah and we think we're smarter than we are sure, but they actually right. outsmart us so anyway <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> i was waiting for you to look at me like that yeah. i'm starting to get the eye stare for a minute <laughs> there we go I just don't like the fact that I can't send you gifts. Like, I have to draw pictures and mail them to you because yeah. you can't get them on your phone. <laughs> That's right. You tried sending right. me a gift the other day. Uh, and like, I just I can't gotta... get them. Yeah, yeah. I was like, you know, it was a glorious Dwight from the office gift, oh, too. I man. really thought that through. And you're like, sorry, I can't see them. <laughs> By the way, big thanks to Des Farrell who sent us a, a super chat just saying, good job. Thanks a lot, man. Uh, thank you. Man, glory to Jesus Christ. Uh, as we wrap up here, tell people how they can get involved in your ministry. Actually, somebody asked that, Ryan Pope. He's sure. like, that's exciting. He wants to learn more about Just a Guy in the Pew. Is he, is he the one that was at the weekend yes, and he gave you the, yes, the, good memory. the trophy yes, from the office? Yes, yeah. Yes, hey, yes, Ryan, yes. it's good to, good to yeah. hear from you. Um, just a guy in the pew.com. Everything's there. So we've got the podcast. The podcast we've got about 150 audio uh, episodes, but we also do interviews. Matt's going to come on here uh, on mine here soon. Uh, so we've had, you know, Sonic Corbett and people like that on. So you can see all that. If you want to sign up for The Narrow Road, uh, you can do that at justagownapew.com too. Those will be mailed out to you monthly. They'll focus on a different virtue. Really help you out in your life if you're wanting to start a start habits in your life that keep you on the right way. And then you can book me for all sort of things on the page too. So if you yeah. want to you know, start a men's group in your parish, that's what I'm really passionate about, Matt. We were talking yeah. about that. Is I don't, I, I'll go and give a talk, but I would much rather come and, and, and help you know, build something that'll last. I love that. Yeah, start something that'll last. You don't just kind of come in, hit people with the Jesus stick, yeah, as you say, right. and leave, have right. them crying and leave. That's right. Mic drops. So it'd be better. You, you come to set up something, which is just yeah. so terrific. Right. Well, I know I've seen the need of it for men. So, like, it's a real vulnerable, uh, authentic sort of place where you can take the mask off, leave them at the door, and be yourself. That's what most men are looking for. I just want to be myself, right? I'm tired of acting like all this other stuff. Yeah. So you can find all I that at justagownapew.com, conferences, parish missions, all those things there. Good stuff. And again, yeah. links to Just a Guy in the Pew. That's at the very top of the description below. So I just ask everybody, please click that out. Check out the great work that John's doing. Uh, and John, thank you very, very kindly for coming all this way and yeah. being on the show. This has been awesome. Oh, dude, thank you. I, I really enjoy your friendship and the opportunity you give me, man. Thank you. Done. Cool. All right. Awesome.